ओम शाहना भवतु शाहनो गुनकु आहा विजन करवा बलि हे जसि नाबदि तमस्त मा बि दिशा बलि ओम शांति 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 I extend my sincere to the holy trio, Akul Ma Samiji, for a strength to be the winner, a successful one. Here is present our severe from the Maharaj, negative from the Commission of the Pool, Vinavit, severe from the Commission of the Maharaj, the Maharaj, principal of the Ramsey, the Presidential College Autonomous. Other collecting our respected honorable speaker, the head of the department of English, our beloved and respected colleagues, audience, and our students. We meet here at the Hello? At the and his works the home and the world a small tribute to the master on his works this is also commemorating the annual of our college and this is part of that legacy on behalf of where we will engage ourselves the great works of of stories delineating the characters character psyche the history behind the development of a particular script the manuscripts of the artist as a way to understand race creative world the different aspects of his films song camera work and much more our erudite speakers will enlighten us on these areas. On the first day, we have with us Professor Vishwajit Ray from Vishwabharati University, Professor Somik Banerjee from Shivani Mandal Mohabindalai, Professor Onushtu Basu from University of Illinois, Arvana Champaign, USF, and Mr. Gautam Ghosh, noted filmmaker, as speakers. On second day, here on this platform, we will have Professor Pinaki Day, internationally acclaimed illustrator, Professor Anindo Shengupta, Department of Film Studies, Jadapur University, Professor Moinad Vishash, Department of Film Studies, Jadapur University once again, as speakers, we will end our tribute to Ray by a conversation with Ray's son, Mr. Sundib Ray, a famous film director, a live interview of Mr. Sundib Ray, Sundeep Ray will be conducted by Professor Riddhi Goswami of Heritage College of Technology, a member of Ray Society. Our program will go live on YouTube virtual platform for the audience with and our host of speakers uh, and uh, will deliver lecture on StreamYard virtual studio. Without any more of your precious time, start, start the proceedings by seeking the words of blessing of our future secretary Maharaj of our Astrama. At the beginning of this webinar, he will formally announce the beginning of this webinar with address. I request Maharaj to take over. Maharaj, please. It is my proud privilege to welcome you all to the prestigious webinar organized by Ramkish. On the occasion of, of Sri Sotojit Ray, it is, it is indeed a matter of great pride and joy to celebrate the birth centenary of Sri Sotojit Ray, who was not only a versatile genius, 
but also one of the icons of Bengal, working within technological as well as financial constraint, Ray still managed to produce world-class film that drew accolades from all around the globe and placed Indian firmly, India firmly on the map of modern cinema. He uncon his uncontested reputation is a testimony to the power of genuine talent and hard work. In spite of his stature as one of the greats of the world of film, Ray was humble enough to write stories, make films for children. To the young minds of Bengal, he probably better known for his de uh, detective and science fiction stories than his films. Like a true master, Ray approached all work, writing, filmmaking, illustration, music composition with utmost devotion and aimed for perfection in all of them. His multifaceted expertise is well recorded in accounts of his co-workers, admirers. Ray received many major awards in his career, including 32 Indian National Film Awards. The government of India honored him with the Bharat Ratna its highest civilian award in 1992. Ray received many noticeable award and gained a prestigious position over his lifetime. Ray received an honorary academy award in 1992, becoming the first Indian to receive honorary Oscar. But in spite of all athletes, Ray preferred to lead a very private life away from grief and glamour. Today's observance is not only a celebration of his work and his genius, but also a great role model who will continue to inspire generation of young minds in their pursuit of perfection in all fields of life. Today we are very happy to have esteemed speaker amongst us in this prestigious webinar, Sri Biswajit Ray, Bishwabharati University. He will discuss some aspect of Ray's thought on science. We have another speaker, Professor Somik Banerjee, Sivani Mandal Mahavidyalaya. We have another speaker, Sri Anustu Basu, University alumnus at Albana campaign and another speaker, Mr. Gautam Ghosh, film director. His subject is very interesting. My journey with Ray while making documentary on the Mastrio. And we have also another speaker, Sri Swami, uh, Swami Sastru Ganandaji, principal Ramakrishna Mission Residential College Autonomous Narendrapur. And we have Anup Mandal. He is the assistant professor of Department of English, Ramakrishna Mission Residential College, Narendrapur. And C. Arjo Ghos, he is the head of the Department of English, Ramakrishna Mission Residential College, Narendrapur. Before wrap up, I would like to quote the famous Vedic prayer that is Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, may all be happy, may all be healthy. Namaskar, Dhanavar. Thank you,
we are truly indebted to maharaj secretary maharaj pranam for his erudite speech on satyajit ray uh, next our beloved respected principal maharaj will deliver his message uh, for this webinar and he will also say uh, for the success of this uh, webinar too so maharaj principal maharaj please रामकृष्ण मिशन रेसिडेंसियल कलेज नरेंद्रपुर इज सेलिब्रेटिंग इट्स डायम जुबिली इन दिस एकेडेमिक सेशन despite the pandemic situation prevailing not only in this part of the globe but everywhere we have decided to continue our academic pursuit especially in this academic session when we are at a milestone on the journey of our college so in the beginning of the session our faculty members and other experts decided that we would try to organize to try we try to organize some academic activities and as now seminars are not possible because of this physical distancing norms even being masked so we decided that it is better to organize this with this type of webinars a number of departments has already organized a good number of webinars on the academic teams so get full to the department of english part of the department professor arya ghosh and its colleagues and specially i am thankful to ashim mondol or uh, one of the one of our enthusiastic faculty members of the english department for organizing this webinar satyajit ra always invites attention is popularity within court is popularity among the um, among different generations of bengali folk as well as among the indians is really fearless when we read kimachali of vibhuti bhushan bandopadhyay we get a masterpiece of our bengali literature but when we see when we view the film pathir panchali as if we witness a new text which is coming out of the written novel and this creation of a new text on the canvas or in in the field is undoubtedly a great a great wonder still to us just other day when i asked one of my students young students whether he has read pathir panchali first he told yes then i reiterated have you read the novel he told no no i have seen pathir panchali really instead of reading pathir panchali seeing pathir panchali is a phenomenon even today and it will remain so in new in far future too not only pathir panchali 
credit are a large number of variety of creative uh, creative things rather of uh, this um, uh, films short stories detective stories and also illustrations what not in the last century perhaps he is one who became the icon of bengali talent the icon of bengal bengali social cultural movement during the passage of last century further i would try to remember that his contribution in the field of bengali literature is also highly mentioned worthy different scholars writers critics have deliberated upon his creations his writings i fervently hope that the scholars who will be presenting their thoughts during the during these two days webinar will highlight diverse horizons of rise talent his creative genius i believe that the scholars the participants the academicians who will view this webinar now or even after as it will be uploaded on it will remain uploaded on the youtube the college youtube channel so whoever will be viewing or will be listening to all these lectures all these discourses i strongly believe they will not only benefit from it rather they will get new lights in their own academic pursuit any academic seminar should involve all academic discussions should involve the pondering the deep thought of all the participants satyajit ray is such a personality in today's bengali bengal culture that if we go deep into his personality his creations we will be able to unravel variety of aspects of bengal's cultural evolution in post independent era its rural changes its urban transformations its cultural conflicts different dichotomies in its socio cultural economic life hence while deliberating upon satyajit ray we will not only try to see a creative genius as i have already told but also will try to uncover the history of our own time which perhaps is being which perhaps is coming in the center of our discussion even today hence it's a it is going to be a mental feast for the for all the participants to attend this webinar to listen to the discussions of our experts and scholars i welcome 
all the experts, all the speakers, all the scholars who will be discussing on different facets of Ray's life and his creations. And I also welcome all the listeners, all the viewers of this webinar. Once again, I thank you all and expecting a expecting an unimaginable mental feast that you will going to you will uh, you will you will be having in coming two days. Thank you. Namaskar. Uh, we are really really indebted. Uh, Maharaj made us humble uh, for his, uh, by his words of encouragement, and uh, we, we really uh, look forward to this uh, to this uh, webinar. Now, our head department of English, Professor Arjugos, will deliver his message for our students and also the audience who are actually watching this whole program uh, to the virtual platform uh, YouTube uh, channel, YouTube link. And uh, before uh, I uh, invite Arjun Ghosh, uh, we would like to uh, express our heartfelt thanks to uh, noted uh, film director, uh, Mr. Gautam Ghosh, our uh, first speaker, Mr. Jidre, and uh, Professor Somi Garanti uh, for their presence and sharing the screen. Uh, Arjuna, please deliver your message. Already, uh, welcome note has been struck. First by Mr. Sri Maharaj and then by our principal. I don't uh, lend them uh, my speech. The explanation is brief, but it will remain brief. I am thankful to Mr. Pashim Mandal for initiating this uh, first webinar uh, in a series of webinars this year which the Department of English is organizing to celebrate the Diamond Jubilee of the College, College in Singapore. In other years, during this time, uh, uh, we will be organizing student seminars across the state, which includes uh, students and researchers from that or even uh, students of outside states, whether uh, due to the current situation, we have to suspend our regular uh, seminar activities. Uh, but uh, to compensate, we have come up with a plan of organizing four webinars before the end of this year as our department held initiative to commemorate. Uh, this is the first webinar of this round. Remedy of try works. Professor Oshim Mondal is the convener of this seminar. Professor Shonko Ghosh uh, is joint convener. Shonko was a former student of the department. And Professor Oshim is an energetic. Uh, Endeavor specialist. He has uh, pulled all the ropes in his hands to make this possible. I am grateful to all the speakers who are very busy, creative individuals, engaged otherwise with their PhD schedule, but they have taken time off that PhD schedule uh, to speak on the forum of this webinar. Already, uh, our dear Sikhi Maharaj has mentioned 
the names of the last two speakers. Uh, today, uh, the first speaker will be Rishi Vindrai, once again, an student of the institution, and today, uh, professor of uh, Bangalore Department at Vishwabharat University, uh, followed by Professor Shomit Banerjee, once again, a budding intellectual, and a professor of Shivan Mandal Mahabhutalai. He has already a few books to his credit. Vishwajit knows no introduction. He is now a name by himself. Uh, then followed by Professor Anishtu Patil, a film specialist, speaking from the University of Illinois. Uh, thank you, sir, for agreeing to uh, our proposal. And the final speaker today is none but our dear, very dear, highly celebrated filmmaker, Mr. Welcome everybody on behalf of the Department of English uh, and this college and uh, share this webinar open. I uh, hand this over to Ashim for compare and further. Thank you, Arjuna, for his eloquent speech. Now, we will directly uh, go into the uh, webinar, the lecture we will listen to on erudite speakers. We have with us right now, as per our schedule, Professor Vishwajit Rai. Should you die? Once again, I think mean the budding intellectual. Vishwidra is presently working as an associate professor of Bengali at Vishwabharati. His publication on Shoktujit includes Professor Shokpur's Space Diary. His essay, Rabindranath and his time is included in the Cambridge Companion to Rabindranath Tagor. Ray, a well known columnist, writes regularly for the Andhavaja Putrika about socio cultural aspects of Bengali life. So, Vishwajit, it's your turn and this virtual floor is for yours. Thank you, Ashimda. I think I'm audible and visible too. Well, I must give my thanks to the authority of the Rodandrapur Ramakrishna Mission Residential College for inviting me in this webinar. And I hope the internet link will work for me uh, for another 35 or 40 minutes without interruption and I will able to deliver my talk before you. In this situation, it is a strange experience. Now we speak before the computer, before the laptop, instead of the audience and instead of their eyes. So indeed a strange situation. Well, the topic of my thought, the title of my thought, some aspects of Ray's thoughts on science. This is the topic of my lecture. And I want to restrict myself within 35 to 40 minutes. And I hope I can restrict myself within the time frame. Let me begin. I will use Ray's adventure stories of Professor Shunku, some of his short stories, and his three films, Kanchan Jonga of 1962, Pratit Dundi of 1970, and Agantuk of 1991, as primary text to support my interpretations. Actually, my aim is to reread these texts 
to formulate Ray's philosophy of science, which I think is an important critic to state-sponsored, capital-based scientific modernism. I will begin my talk with Shonku. Shottajit's Shonku captured my imagination of boyhood days by his adventure stories. I can still remember those pre-globalization days of early 80s of the previous century. In our middle class family, adventure stories of Professor Shonku was undoubtedly a great feast for me and my dada. We waited for the Anandamala. At that time, Nirandranath Chakraborty was the editor of that Bengali periodical. And Shottajit wrote his Sanku stories for that periodical once a year. Shottajit himself did the color illustrations for his Sanku tales. In those days, all of you know, color pictures were a rarity and Anandamala was indeed a bright exception. Shottajit's bold and realistic multicolored sketches provided us wings of fancy. In those pre-Google decades, Shottajit's beautiful illustrations gave us the enjoyment of traveling around the world through pictures. We indeed travel with Shonku in different parts of the world. Before Ray's Shonku, Bengali readers had the pleasure of following Premendra Mitro's Ghanada. Ghanada also ventures into the nooks and corners of the globe and narrates splendidly his adventurous travelers in front of his perplexed boarding house mates in his attic room. He is a typical Bengali character from North Kolkata who talks a lot and justifies his long speeches by the sheer power of his gripping oratory. Kanada likes to eat and we liked Ghanada very much for his nature, for his capacity of storytelling. Premendra Mitro created successfully an effect of momentary suspension of disbelief in his Ghanada stories. Shottajit, however, brought a paradigm shift in this literature by his Shonku tales. To begin with, Shonku is not a representative Bengali Babu of Kolkata. He lives mile away from the mainland of Bengal. He has his ancestral house at Giridi, a small town in Jharkhand. Now in Jharkhand, previously it was in Bihar. Unlike Bengalis, he speaks less and works hard and confines himself in his small indigenous laboratory. He has more than 70 inventions to his credit. As a great inventor, he gets invitations from fellow scientists of different countries. Though extremely busy in his works, he maintains a personal diary almost on a daily basis. We read eagerly those interesting accounts from his diaries that Shottajit painted for us. Shonku can go anywhere in and beyond the world. Vitality was the basic element of his diary that mesmerized us. Shottajit's Shonku series continued for almost three decades. The first adventure of Shonku, Bomjatri Diary, was printed in 1961. The last story of Shonku, Sharnoporni, Gold Leaf, Porni means Pata, Leaf, was published in Puja Number of Anandamala in 1990, just before Shottajit's demise. During these three decades, Shottajit's scheme of writing Shonku stories had evolved in many ways. 
In the early phase, Shatajit planned to create Shunku as a mild-mannered version of Professor Challenger of Arthur Conan Doyle. He was influenced even by his father, who once created a strange character named Nithiram Patkel. Nithiram, who invented many peculiar things, was particularly famous for his Gondho Bikot Tel, pungent oil that has many uses, such as in Nithiram's own pronouncement. I quote my own translation from Shukumar's Bangla. If you take this oil, it will cure your large spleen. Pliha. If you massage this oil on your body, it will cure all disease. And if you apply it under your nose, a long moustache will out in one and a half days. Shanku's physical features resemble with Nithiram's. In his first story, Shanku confesses to have made a strange compound by mixing mushrooms with cells of tortoise eggs and date barks of snakes. This claim is clearly comical and nonsensical. Shatyajit intentionally created these comical effect for his young readers. Besides performing these Nithiramesque activities, Shonku, like Professor Challenger of Arthur Conan Doyle, takes angry steps against anyone he dislikes. For example, he once triggered a snuff gun in Bangla, Noshastro, at his helping hand, Prahlad. Prahlad, the poor chap, sneezed continuously for 33 hours. This first adventure story of Professor Shonku was serialized in Shandesh, a family periodical published by Rays. Upendra Kishor, Shatyajit's grandfather, was the founder editor of this periodical. Shatyajit's father, Shukumar, also edited Shandesh for a short period before his untimely death. Shatyajit, having received some editorial support, from his communist poet friend Shubhash Mukhopadhyay, revived this extremely popular children's periodical in independent India. Shanku's first adventure was a fantastic story of a missing scientist. In the beginning of this story, the author had to give a short note on Shanku for the readers. I am quoting my translation from Bangla. Who is Professor Shanku? Where is he? I know this much that he is a scientist. According to many, he lost his life while performing a dangerous experiment. It is also heard that he is doing his experiments secretly in an unknown place and he will come out at the right time. But as Shatyajit intended, arrogant Shanku gradually changes himself into a thoughtful person. Shatyajit's early plan took a different shape in course of time. Shunku progressively became his favorite persona for commenting on issues of science for more than 20 years. Now I am reading out an interview of Shatyajit Rai. This interview was published in Kishore Ganbikyan. Puja number of 1982. In this interview, Ray says, Prothome Shunkur Golper Mejad Chilo comic, Baglate Professor, Tar Jontropati Shahadje, J Space Ship Toidi Korechilo, Vingrohe Jabar Juno, Shetao at a comedy Dharone Chilo. Pore Shunkur Mejad Bodlejai on a serious hoy. This serious Professor Shanku, of course, was favorite persona of Shatyajit for commenting on issues and issues of science. Okay, now I am coming to the short stories. In his short stories, Ray also uses many elements from the different fields of science: evolution and counter-evolution of man, alien from other planet sudden entries of prehistoric animals and birds, 
are important themes that recur in his stories. I can name some of them, for example, Mriganku Babu Khatuna, incident of Mriganku Babu, where you can read a story of counter evolution. Onkushar, Gulapi Babu, or Tipu, mathematics teacher, Gulapi Babu and Tipu is a very good example of how a alien enters in the scenario and do, does an excellent job for Tipu, a school boy. And the third one is Brihat Chonchu, bird with gigantic beak. Uh, it is a story of prehistoric bird. So these themes are common in Ray's short stories. These elements are used not only to perplex the young readers, but in many ways, these elements are engaged to question the sense of causality, which is an important aspect of particular scientific school. Now, I will read the story, Mathematics Teacher, Golapi Babu and Tipu. Narohari Babu, a good teacher of mathematics, warns Tipu's father about the adverse effects of fairy tales on the young student's mind. He says to Mr. Chaudhuri, Tipu's father, that what he is saying is an outcome of his prolonged thinking and research. According to him, folk tales and fairy tales are good sources of superstitions. He suggests that young readers must read biographies of respectable men and adventure stories of science. Tipu's father obeys Narahuri Babu's suggestions and locks the cupboard that holds the books of fairy tales. This incident makes Tipu melancholic. At this point of the story, Gulapi Babu, the alien, re-enters and teaches Narahuri Babu a fantastic lesson that experimental science can hardly decipher. Narahuri Babu rides a horse named Pegasus. All of you know Pegasus uh, is a character of mythology. Narahuri Babu rides that horse Pegasus every day. This horse actually belongs to Vishnuram Babu, Chase partner of Tipu's mathematics teacher. The alien uses his supernatural power and transforms Pegasus into a winged horse that gives Narahuri Babu an incredible ride to the moon. In this mysterious story, Ray uses miracles of subjects. Thomas Aquinas classifies miracles in three categories. A, miracles of substance, B, miracles of subject, and C, miracles of mold. What is miracle of subject? When an animate object transforms into another animate object, it is called miracle of subject. British scientist J.B.S. Haldon, in his storybook, My Friend Licky, uses miracles of substance. Haldon makes difference between conjurer and real magician. Conjurer is a clever man who merely makes people fool, and real magician uses his power to give people justice. Leakey is a real magician who transforms Oliver, his unfortunate dying friend, into an octopus. Oliver had lost his legs in a train accident, and as Leakey was not able to cure him, it transformed him into an octopus so that he could survive. Like Halton, Ray also uses miracles of subjects in his stories for giving justice to the people who seems to, be, to believe in a pluralistic world instead of monistic world of experimental science. Halden was a strong critic of the imperial policy of his country and got citizenship of India. He was a scientist of unique spirit who shared his intimate views with Arnold Lunn, author of the seminal book, Flight from Risen, published in 1930. In this book, Lunn shows the limitation of Risen. Later, 
held in long dialogues are published as Science and Supernatural, a correspondence between Arnold Lund and Jebius Haldin. Haldin's differentiation of conjurer and real magician reminds me of a letter written by Rabindranath to his beloved poet friend, Romeo Chakraborty. Tagore writes, I'm reading out the Bangla first, then my own translation. Tagore writes, বিজ্ঞানে যেখানে পরমাণুর পরম তত্ত্বের সামনে আমাদের বিস্মিত মনকে দাঁড় করায় সেখানে চরমকে দেখি কিন্তু বাষ্পের যোগে যেখানে রেলগাড়ি চলে সেখানে ক্লেভারকে দেখি পারফেক্টকে দেখি নে টেগোর রাইটস মাই ট্রান্সলেশন হোয়ার সায়েন্স স্ট্যান্ডস বিফোর মাই অ্যাস্টনিস্ট মাইন্ড উইথ দ্য থিওরি অফ অ্যাথম আই সি দেয়ার দ্য ইমার্টাল But when train moves on by the power of steam, I see there a clever instead of a perfect. I'm repeating, I see there a clever instead of a perfect. Here Tagore makes a difference between pure science and technology. Pure science is perfect, but technology is clever. In his plays, Muktadhara and Raktakarubi, Tagore shows how statist power uses technology against the people in muktadhara bivuti a state sponsored engineer makes a dam over a river so that authority can stop giving water to his subjects of colony shiptarai in rays film hirok rajar deshe a paid scientist also works for the king of hirok he makes a chamber where he forcefully locked the opponents and wash their brain by using scientific machines power and technology are used in common people in modern state now i am coming to the film film is the most important creative medium through which ray was able to put his arguments on science before the larger audience Though adventure stories of Professor Shunku and other literary works of Ray are very popular among the Bengali readers, they never reach beyond the Bengali audience unless they are translated. But the language of film is universal in a sense and films with subtitle can easily cross the barriers of language. The three important films of Ray that I have chosen raise three basic issues that are gradually ignored by the nation state powerful nation state i would say in his film kanchan jangha re proposes how the power mongering nation states destroy ecological balance of our globe by using technology in pratidwandi he shows he, he shows landing on the surface of moon is a scientific miracle but science and technology does not work for providing basic needs of the common people in his last major film agantuk he questions the validity of discrimination between civilized and uncivilized kanchan jangha was released in 1962 during the last phase of nehruvian regime Nehru, the first prime minister of independent India, enthroned science almost as a demigod. In his book, The Discovery of India, Nehru wrote, I quote, what we need is a scientific approach, the adventurous and yet critical temper of science, the search for truth and new knowledge, the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial. all the seeds necessary not merely for the application of science but for life itself and the solution of its many problems this clearly was a reaction from a man who had seen the deprivation of native scientists in pre independent india british colonizers intentionally humiliated indian scientists for example all of you know jagdish chandra bosu a friend of rabindranath was offered only half the salary of his shahib colleagues when he joined the presidency college as a faculty after returning from england he hardly had any fine scientific instrument to work with 
for his own scientific research. So he was forced to take help from a blacksmith who made indigenous instruments for him. Common people of the West generally ridiculed India as a land of black magic superstitions and snake charmers. Therefore, India badly needed the scientific temper at that very hour. As Prime Minister of Sovereign India, Jawaharlal Nehru honestly wanted to raise the position of his country and his countrymen before the eyes of the West. Shatyajit Shanku too tried to uphold his country. Shanku makes an excellent robot which costs only 333 rupees and seven and a half annas. After making his robo, he gladly comments in his diary, my translation, should the outside world not be informed what a Bengali scientist has done with minimum equipment. This propaganda is meant for my country, not for me. That's my real aim. But spreading of the nationalist pride is neither Shonku's nor Shottajit's only goal. Though Shonku uses science as a tool for expressing his nationalist pride, later he often feels that reduction of all knowledge to scientific conformity is a foolish act. I am repeating. Reduction of all knowledge to scientific conformity is a foolish act. I want to make a passing comment here. Shottajit, as a student of Shanti Niketan, possibly imbibed these values of life from the philosophy of Rabindranath. Ray, in his student days, saw Binod Bihari and Ram Kinkar, respected teachers of Kala Bhavan, who did not believe in scientific conformity. I have mentioned earlier that the last important adventure story of Shonku, Sharnopurni, was published in the Puja number of Anandamala. And for the first time, Ray here uh, write about, writes about the formative years of the professor Shonku. Shonku's father was a renowned physician. He had given him important suggestions regarding his future plan after he graduated from the University of Calcutta. His father says, my translation, don't bother to get a job in such a young age. You have studied science for long. Now for the next four years, please do study other subjects, art, literature, history, philosophy, no dearth of subject is there. Shanku, like Ray, became a liberal humanist. Now, I would like to quote here a few observations of Shanku that he expresses in his diary. Hey, I have taken this from the story Kampu. Shanku writes in his diary, Kampu is undoubtedly a spectacular invention by man. Kampu means computer. However, it is also true that in making of complex machines, mankind has failed to compete with nature, the finest creator. Shonku thinks the nature is the finest creator. In Bangla, Jotil Jantra Toiri Dabare Akuno Prokriti Dhare Kacheo Pongchote Pareni Manush. In this comment, Shonku rejects that view which posits science over nature. B. I am quoting a line from Incredible Man, Ascharjo Jantu. Man's greed for knowing everything must not cross its limit. Manusher shob jenefalar lover at a shima thaka uchit. Knowledge sometimes transforms into destructive greed. For example, we can think of Tagore's king of Raktokarabi who wants to destroy the flower Raktokarabi to know why Nondini puts it on her hand as a bangle? The third one I have taken from the story, Professor Shonku and Ghost. Shonku writes, I believe seriously for years that supernatural aspects like ghosts, planchet, telepathy, clairvoyance will come into the domain of science one day. 
Of course, I know the third one is definitely problematic indeed. Shottojit's story and the film Sonar Kella that revolves around a boy who can recall snippets of his previous birth invited criticisms for its theme from the hardcore rationalists. But the first two observations of Shonku importantly criticize dogmas of scientific creed that wants to enthrone science over everything. And the third one announces the existence of laws beyond the experimental science. Economist Frederick Hayek, a good friend of Karl Popper, coined the term scientism. He explained it as the scientific prejudice in his seminal book, The Counter-Revolution of Science, Studies on the Abuse of Reason, published in 1952, five years after the independence of India. By scientism, we generally mean a belief that assumed scientific methods are equally essential to all other disciplines, including humanities and social sciences. But Shottojit and his Shanku, both of them, think of an independent space beyond the world of science. A careful reader may cite three or four interrelated hypotheses regarding science in Shottojit's text, both written and cinematic. Now, those hypotheses. Number one, as a rationalist, Shottojit depends on scientific approaches for eradicating superstitions and religious dogmas that rob people of their money and health in his native country. He rightly thinks commercialization of religion is a heinous crime that pushes his country backward. For example, in his film, Ganeshatru, an atheist doctor fights against the enemy of the people who makes lots of money in temple business. Ray's views about our world is clearly anthropomorphic. He believes in peaceful coexistence with nature. Consciousness is animal. He is one of his favorite theme for writing adventure stories of Shanku. Destruction of ecology and environment for the sake of scientific development does not get any approval for him. Though modern empirical science can give answers to many unsolved questions of life, it also fails to solve many mysteries. Science has its own limitations. The last one, Ray rejects exaggerated myth of scientific progress. According to him, the power of cognition may be manifested in a caveman on a particular point of time to fulfill his need for living in a difficult environment. Therefore, civilized people should respect their ancestors instead of calling them mere primitives. More importantly, different aboriginal communities still existing in this globe beyond the periphery of modern scientific civilization must not be forced to leave their own culture. Keeping these words in our mind, let us reread and rethink Ray's three films. Number one, Kanchanjanga. We often fail to notice the coincidence that Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, and Ray's film, Kanchanjanga, both were produced in the same year. Though Kanchanjanga is a film of poetic quality released under Nehruvian era, it never hides the filmmaker's uneasiness about nuclear technology. Carson's famous book also lays the foundation to environmental ethics. In the first chapter of her book, she describes a fable for tomorrow as she writes, I quote from her book, there was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people spoke of them puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. Silent Spring is a devastating attack on human carelessness, greed, and of course, irresponsibility. Their irresponsible scientific experiments for grabbing power and satisfying gigantic commercial demands kill other animals and damage the ecological balance. 
in Kanchenjunga, Jagadish Bad Watcher walks up and down at the mall in Darjeeling in search of birds. He meets a young man called Ashok from Kolkata. Ashok, although unemployed, refuses an offer that he received from Indranath, Jagadish's brother-in-law. Jagadish, a man of alternative values, expresses his concerns about migratory birds to Ashok during his stroll. Jagadish says in a mellowed voice that one day these migratory birds will fall dead like raindrops from the sky due to nuclear tests performed by the powerful nations. We perhaps thus can relate Carson's trouble to this touching scene from Kanchanjanga. This film can be related in a different way to Shonku's experience of a wise crow corpus. Shonku helps this bird to be equipped to confront a greedy scientist. At the end of the story, Corvus matches high-powered spectacles of a piggy man who plans to use bird's intelligence commercially. The wise bird ultimately takes revenge. I would like to refer here to an article by Karl Popper. Popper delivered the Tanner Lecture on Human Values at the University of Michigan in 1978. The title of his lecture was Three Worlds. In this lecture, he challenges those who uphold a monist studies and a dualist view of the universe. He proposes instead a pluralist view. He recognizes at least three different but interacting sub-universes. World one is a world of physical objects, both living and non-living. World two is the mental or psychological world, which could be subdivided in various ways. Both human consciousness and animal consciousness are part of this world. World three is the world of the products of human minds. In this beautiful lecture, Popper establishes his arguments step by step. I am not sure whether Shatyajit read this lecture or not. However, like Popper, I think Shatyajit also believed in plurality. Shatyajit's Shonku stories are immensely important texts for disseminating values of pluralism instead of restricting the young mind under the surveillance of scientific prejudice. Scientific prejudice also divided our timeline into two parts. We proudly justify our enlightened progress from uncivilized to civilized world. Shatyajit addresses this issue in his film Agantuk, where Marxist Paul Dotto acts in the role of Monomohan, a liberal humanist like Professor Shonku. After traveling around the world, he came back to his business house in Kolkata. Mamata Shankar played the role of his niece. Monomohan uh, came to her niece's Kolkata house as an outsider. The husband of his niece understandably thought that Monmohan is a big fraud and thus arranged to be interrogated by family friends. During this angry exchange, Monmohan sarcastically demonstrated his own philosophy of life. Monmohan had deep respects for Aboriginal people. He liked their culture and also believed that they have their own forms of science. They have their own forms of science. As a voracious reader, Monomohan read books on art, literature, history, and philosophy. His multidisciplinary reading habit made him liberal. I am sure Monomohan Mitro would have been extremely happy to read a particular story of Professor Shonku titled Professor Shonku and Kuchapamber Caves. In this story, Shonku meets a lone cat man who creates his beautiful world of science and culture out of stone. In the film Aguntuk, Vritiman Chatterjee acted in a role of a family friend who questioned Monomohan. This same actor played 
the role of a young job seeker Siddhartha in Ray's film Pratidwandi in 1970, where the character was asked in an interview to identify the most outstanding and significant event of the previous decade. After a hesitating pause, the answer came from Siddhartha's mouth, Vietnam War. His answer obviously surprised the interviewers. Why does a bright young student mark the Vietnam War as more significant than landing on the moon? For example, is he a communist? Shatujit was not a hardcore communist, but he thinks for the people. People of diverse nature attract his interest. He knows reason sometimes makes closer that restricts the entry of the common people to the world of science and technology. Landing on the moon is definitely a scientific miracle, but this miracle does not ensure food for all. In the story, Mohakash Dut, messenger from the outer world, Shatojit's beloved inventor fails to answer a riddle given by the alien. A piece of stone is handed over to him, and the alien says if Shonku is able to open the luminous stone, he can solve the problem of food for the people of the world. I am reading the Bengali one. A Ashurjo Pathore to Kuror Mote, Kikore Atoto to Luki Thakte Parish, at the Kew Bir Kurte Pari to Ami Parbu. A Bishashe, Amachar Buntu Shet Amake, Die Die Che. Ami got to do shop the Hutore. আমার গবেষণাগারে অজস্র পরীক্ষা করেও এটা রহস্য উদ্ঘাটন করতে পারি আমি বুঝেছি আরো সময় লাগবে কারণ আমাদের বিজ্ঞান এখনো এত দূর অগ্রসর হয়নি ইন দ্য স্টোরি অ্যাজ আই হ্যাভ রেড শঙ্কু ফেলস টু ডু ইট বাট হি নেভার লুজেস হিজ হোপ রে অ্যাজ এ ক্রিয়েটার অলসো বিলিভ দ্যাট সায়েন্স হ্যাড ইটস ওন limitations but he never lost his hopes in humanity he changed the ending of ibsen's play enemy of the people in his film adaptation ganashatru where people stands with the atheist doctor to fight against the commercialization of temples so i think i will end here thank you thank you very much We are really, really thankful. We are really proud of you being the uh, alumni of this institution. And you died reading of Grace Cotton Pine, especially uh, those things played in the characters, like Shom and the other characters in his film. And you talk about, but uh, Sutojit or the peaceful coexistence with the nature. And we have got so many ideas and so many uh, pool of thought that has actually tingled together in uh, raised thought and how he has, uh, I should not say manipulated, but he has. Uh, taken all these things in his own style and uh, he has uh, used all those things uh, in his uh, movie. So once again, uh, we can open this session uh, for question answer if anyone is to the chat box, any questions? So audience who are here in the uh, YouTube channel, if you have any questions to our uh, speaker, Vishwajit, uh, Vishwajit Rai, then you can write your questions in the chat box. We can take the answers 
I'll take the questions from there and uh, it will answer uh, that question. Okay. The audience can put down their questions there in the chat box. They are writing all this wonderful speech. No question, any question? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question is coming up. Uh, One question, which is for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one audience, uh, he asked how prophetic this scientific mission was vis a vis today's sci fi film. How prophetic this scientific mission was vis a vis today's sci fi film. Well, uh, Ray uh, never made any sci-fi sci film in his career. He was, it was planned in his lifetime that he uh, wanted to do E.T. for the, uh, for the audience but that that plan he gave up that plan for many reasons but what he did is very interesting thing for example in Gopigain and Baghabain and also in Hirok Rajar Deshe Ray used indigenous uh, I would say indigenous elements and some beautiful aesthetics to make a film on quote unquote uh, fancy quote unquote science fiction in a sense particularly in Hirokura Jardeshe and Ray was trying to make a statement like Shanku that a, an Indian filmmaker can make an alternative space, an alternative uh, film of, uh, of uh, scientific imagination in a way, in a small budget. The budget is very important. And I think uh, for Ray, film is an interesting medium of art. He never wanted mm, to, uh, I would say, he never wanted to spend huge amount of money for the films. So this is my response, initial response, that Shottojit had his own aesthetics regard, regarding film on science, on imagination, etc. This much. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. There is one more question uh, from uh, one of our students. Do you think the idea that not all knowledge is under the scientific purview is influenced by our current 
limitations in science and is there a chance of this idea being disproved in the future it's true and i think shatojit uh, was an agnostic in larger sense he thought that science uh science has its own limitations and there are other uh fields of knowledge they can supplement the science and shanku for example shanku never loses his hope one day many disciplines can go together and hopefully they will solve our problems there might be many problems unsolved it is like our journey like a journey uh, as in mathematics we have the idea of tends to infinity so this is a journey journey of our life journey of human civilization it it, it is a journey tends to infinity we could not able to reach the final answer for example shonku says the ultimate thing manusher sob jene phela lover ekta shima thaka uchit this is the i think the final philosophy of frey okay so there is another question but i don't think it is actually question to vishwajit uh, why shonku is raised with twitter as very few female character i don't think i did uh, for is oh i think this is for for his brahmo reservation yeah yeah so the we don't have any female character in shonku we don't have any female character uh, even uh, the crime which we find in fellow the stories are quote unquote very very uh, similar kind of crimes were right. narrated there Yeah. so this is for example shatojit believed in some uh, values that might be conservative so this is my answer okay uh this is uh, i think there is no questions right now so once again mr ji thank you thank you very much uh, for your sensational speech so it really really we are uh, really, really really enriched by your talk thank you thank you ashim for inviting me here and okay. i must thank my internet link <laughs> 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 that helps me a lot and i can uh, give my speech without any interruption thank you okay okay yeah. thank you our our next speaker next speaker is this uh, line up is professor shomi baraji Shomik Banerjee, born in 1986, he is an assistant professor in English in Shivani Mandal Mahavidyalay, situated at Namkhana, South 24 Parganas, West Bengal. Now he is presently pursuing his doctoral research under the supervision of. professor chinmay guha of the university of calcutta uh, his papers and essays have been published in the journal of the asiatic society the journal the department of english university of calcutta and other notable journals and magazines both in bengali and also in english an anthology of his essays written in bengali titled jugantarer chithi 
व्यक्तित्व और साहित्य वॉज पब्लिश इन टू थाउजेंड एंड फिफ्टीन He had also done some important works on local history. He is also engaged as a guest teacher, honorary in the department of this uh, college, our department English in the Amkish Nation Residential College, Autonomous Dorjopur. The book of Bengali essay, Yugantore Chitti, contains an essay which discusses the use of mythologies in the last three films of Satyajit Ray, an article. by professor banerjee on satyajit satyajit unfinished screen play of ekti jivan was published in sharodia anushtuk last year another essay on satyajit ray's visual and linguistic construction of wajid ali shah in satyanti theory is going to be published in sharodia anushtuk this year we are really really looking forward uh, to his speech uh, today his speech he will deliver his speech on the topic first the historical perspective of first 30 minutes of gupi gain bhagavain so so we this virtual space the virtual virtual floor so uh the virtual studio is for you to address our audience so so being thank you thank you ashwinda for your kind words am i audible okay at the outset i uh, i i i deliver my pranam to the most revered shami sarbalokananda ji maharaj the secretary of ranipur ramkrishna mission i am grateful to the revered uh shami shastrogan ondo ji maharaj the pre respected principal of this college professor arjo ghosh the respected head of the department department of english and professor arshim mondol the convener of this program for giving me the chance to participate in it and i genuinely consider myself privileged to share this virtual stage with the stalwarts and eminent speakers so the title of my presentation is interpreting the rural history of bengal the first 30 minutes of gupi gain bakabain i am starting a powerpoint presentation so that uh, it will be easier for me to discuss with the visual re visual references of the scenes i am going to discuss so now i am starting my presentation Yes, I think it is visible now. Interpreting the rural history of Bengal, the first thirty minutes of Gupi Gain Bahabain. Moharaja, tomare selam, mora Bangla deshe theke elam. This is the song. This is the song which which creates the musical identities of Gupi Gain and Bahabain in the famous film Gupi Gain Bahabain. made by shottojit rai which was released in 1969 is is a screen visible i don't know the famous film made for children and released in 1969 moharaja tomare selam ora bangladesh er theke elam okay is it visible when gupi and bagha sing this song in the moment the moment in the, the very moment of the film is uh, it is a moment of the recognition of their talent it is not only the recognition of their talent it is a moment of the honorable rehabilitation of this duo who once had been banished from human society because nurturing of ambition which is highly incongruous in nature with the social class they belong to in this session i am going to interpret the events that precede this moment of recognition and i want to analyze those events from from the perspective of history and while doing so i shall show how shottojit rai has visually created the the socio political atmosphere of rural bengal in the in the late 18th century or the early 19th century bengal 
we should remember that when the movie was released in 1969 the the viewers the critics were baffled to experience such a structural com uh, structurally complex movie and i think the structural complexity of gupika and bhagavai was chiefly due to the amalgamation of various genres in the film some of the critics the critics uh, uh, observed that gupika and bhagavai being a fantasy film ends uh, in such a way which is burdened with moral messages some of the critics commented that the movie starts as a fantasy but ends up being a fable Mari Sato, the famous, famous biographer of Shotujit Rai commented that, I quote, rooted in the texture of this fairy tale, there is Rai's philosophy that excessive wealth is the cause of misery. Palace and prison are synonymous, unquote. However, apart from being a fable or a fantasy, I think the first 30 or 40 minutes of Gubiga and Bhagavan can easily interpret it as a historical film, rather what we call a period film. And the historicity of Gupiga and Bhagavan is constructed in three distinct, distinct modes. First, the direct representation or the realistic representation of socio-political realities of rural Bengal at a particular juncture of history. Second, the historical references used in the sequence of the ghost dancing. And third, the use of the songs. The film starts with this scene when Gupi the son of a grocer is carrying a tanpura and walking by the side of the paddy field. And there is a sentence which is written in Bengali and spread over the screen. The sentence reads, Kanukainer chele gopinakher boro ganer shok. Gupi, the son of Kanukain, is very fond of singing. When the shot starts moving, we find that Gupi is showing his tanpura to a farmer who is working on the field. And the farmer, whom Gupi calls Diju Khudo, fails to recognize the Tanpura. And Gupi introduces the instrument to him and says that, Tumi chasha, ami ostad khasha. You are a farmer, I am a master singer. Now the word ostad demands some critical attention from us. Ostad means, it is a Farsi word. It means master or guru, the master singer. It should be remembered that before the advent of the Muslim rulers, the, the, the Sultan dynasty or the Mughal dynasty, the, uh, the guru was never mentioned as Ustad. Before the advent of Islamic culture in Bengal, there were various forms of singing, such as Chorja Giti in the ancient times, Giti Gatha in the Pal dynasty, Gita Govindo in the Sen dynasty, later Padaboli Kirtan, different types of Kirtan. But all in all these schools, the guru was never mentioned as an ustad. So it is clear that Gupi belongs to a particular historical frame when the Islamic cultural code deeply penetrated into the rural society, rural life of Bengal. Gupi says, Tumi chasha, ami ustad khasha. These are similar sounding words, but actually, they, these two words accentuate a dichotomy an unbridgeable financial, cultural, and social gap between the farmer and the master singer. The farmer works on the fields, grows the crops, pays rent to the king, and the king patronizes the ustad for the royal amusement. It should be love singing. There is no problem in that. But we should ask the question, what type of singing? What school of singing Gupi prefers? It should be noted that Gupi does not like the traditional folk forms of music such as Baul, Kirtan, Kothokota, Pachali, Kobigan, which are the folk forms and which are more in consonance with the social class he belongs to. Gupi, the son of a poor grocer, wants to construct his identity as a practitioner of classical song, that particular form of music which is practiced in the royal courts. When Dijukuro inquires about the type of song Gupi wants to sing, Gupi replies, the song of the Ustad, Gopinath, Gopinath Ustad. Uh, North Indian classical music did not share an organic relationship with the mass. Rather, its practice was confined within the royal and courtly periphery. The common man did not actively participate in the growth and development of North Indian classical music. When in front of an illiterate farmer, 
Gopi claims himself to be an Ustad, he is unknowingly making a statement which is burdened with immense social and political implications. It is a statement that reveals Gopi's specific location in the class structure and his aspiration for ascendance in the class hierarchy. Gopi's ambition is to achieve a higher status in society. He wants to relocate himself in the class hierarchy by developing his skill in Ustadi songs. And I think the Tanpura is a visual reference of his ambition. It is a concretization of his ambition or the symbolization, symbolization of it. How did Gupi collect this Tanpura? This is the, uh, this is the uh, still which shows Gupi is narrating the story of his of how he collected Tanpura from Bollop Gosai to the five old men who are playing the dice sitting under the tree. We come to know that Gupi has collected this Tanpura from Bollop Gosai. Bollop Gosai. This name is very important. Bollop Gosai. We all know that there is a strong tradition of Drupadi singing in Bengal at that time. And there were two famous schools of Drupadi singing. One, Vishnupur and the Beti Agharana. Vishnupur school and Bethia school. Vishnupur school emerged in the last decades of 18th century and Bethia school emerged in the second half of the 19th century. And the surname Goshami or Goshai was frequently found among the practitioners of both these schools. Shamchad Goshai, Khetra Mohan Goshai, Dinobantu Goshai, Radhika Prasad Goshai, Ganendra Prasad Goshai, all of our very famous singers who bear the surname Goshai. So, Bollop Gosai in Gupi Gain Bhagavan is historically located in the last decades of the 18th century or the early 19th century Bengal. However, this Gosai has two Tanpuras. He uses one and he considers the other as unlucky. He keeps the unlucky Tanpura in the corner of this room. This differentiation between the two instruments, instruments indicates a special trait in Gosai's character. What is it? The practice of classical music, the practice of classical singing does not free him from the prejudiced perception of treating something lucky or unlucky. When Gupi requests Goshai to give him the Tanpura, Goshai says, why shall I give it to you free of cost? Ami emni devo gano? Gupi says, we are poor grocers and where shall I get money? Gupi does not have the financial resources to solemnize his discipleship to Goshai. Neither he can afford the monthly fees. So, most importantly, Bollop Goshai compels Gupi to deliver some physical services to him in exchange of that unlucky Tanpura. Gupi arranges the tobacco for him. Gupi massages his legs. Gupi draws water from the well. Gupi kills the rats in the storehouse and so on. We can find the similar situation in a later film of Shottojit Rai. The name of the film was Shadgoti, which was released in 1981. There, Dukhi, a Dalit marginalized figure, had to deliver tremendous physical toil to gain the favor of a priest. Dukhi dies, but Gupi is saved. This is the picture I am showing to you, where King Akbar has come to the deep forest to hear the songs of the famous singer Shami Horidash. The king has come to the singer, but Gupi historically represents a time when the Ustad goes to the court to have the royal favor. What we want to establish is that the lack of ethical concern in the character of Bollop Mushai, his prejudiced mind, his treatment with Gupi it proves that this master singer, the Ustad, belonged to a particular time when classical form of singing was entirely dependent on the feudal patronization. And for this reason, the guru, the ustad himself, imbibes some of the exploitative nature of the feudal lord in his own character. We have, we have come uh, to, the, to access of this all kind of information through the conversation Gupi has with these five old men who are playing dice under the tree. I would request you to closely observe the appearance, the dress of these five old men. Who are they? The first old man wearing a wrapper has a sacred trait in his body. He is a Brahmi. The second old man with a mark of sandal paste on his forehead 
he holds a hookah in his hand the third old man a bald one wears a chador or a wrapper in his body the fourth one wears a mark of vermilion on his forehead and, and a beaded string and the fifth the last one holds a rosary in his hand bears tilak or a sectarian mark on his forehead seemingly he is a vaishnav so all these person are of, are of high caste hindus though there is one vaishnav he silently supports and enjoys the entire episode of the humiliation of gopi this is the quintessential assembly of high caste rural priests combining brahman shakto vaishnav purohit and others gopi calls them thakur mushaira for at least four times in the scene when this thakur mushaira see gopi with the tanpura they want to bully him they do not uh, they do not want to lose this chance of befooling gopi they request gopi to sing a song gopi says that he knows only one song which is structured on the ragini bhairavi ragini and bhairavi ragini is generally sung at morning it is not the appropriate time to sing that song but this old man then one of the old men says so long the shadow of my stick does not touch this piece of stone morning stays jotokkhon na amar joshti chhaya oi prostor khondo sporsho korche totokkhon sokal this sentence is spoken not in colloquial bengali this is spoken in a chest and elegant bengali why for two reasons first this old man wants to underline the socio uh, socio cultural or educational difference between him and gopi and second he wants to elevate it, his utterance to the level of an injunction from shastra however gopi an innocent man he starts singing he is convinced by the words of the old man the old man suddenly moves his stick and gopi's musical performance comes to an unexpected end this brief scene upholds a particular time in bengal when the hindu and the vaishnava priests from rural society do not restrain themselves from making fun of the son of a poor grocer the old men under the tree feel insecure with gopi's appearance with that tanpura they start hatching plans to thwart the ambition nurtured by gopi for achieving something higher than the permissible limit these old men were intelligent enough to understand that gopi's ambition is going to disturb the existing class hierarchy of the society so they are very anxious to maintain the status quo they know that gopi uh, gopi's ambition has to be suppressed but they do not have the administrative power to do so for this reason only for this reason they take help of the feudal lord they know that it is the right of the zamindar or the feudal lord to banish someone from the village or to take any administrative step against someone who is aspiring to 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 break the class hierarchy before they they sent gopi to the king before sending gopi to the king one of the old men says one of the old men renames gopi not as a kain but as a gain he says ganam karati jab sa gain by uttering the sanskrit sentence these priests solemnize or ritualize the entire process of renaming gopi in the original short story written by upendra kishor rai choudhury we all know that this is a short story written by great grandfather of satyajit rai there is no mention of uh, uh, of these priests and the renaming was done by the neighbors of gopi but in the film this renaming is done by the priests however gopi is convinced by their words and he is deliberate to have a recognition of his talent perhaps he knows that only through this royal recognition the his family can be freed from the shackles of poverty now i am coming to the, to, to the king to the to the zamindar in the film the ruler of amloki the village where gopi lives is called raja mushai he is no longer the zamindar but he is, he is sorry he is not greater than a zamindar he is called raja mushai but he is he is a zamindar in true sense a famous book i am uh, showing you the cover of a famous book uh, written by john r maclen who who discussed about the local zamindars of 18th century bengal and i am quoting him quote under both mughal and company rule the provincial government of bengal solicited solicited from delhi confirmation of the titles of raja and maharaja 
by which their subjects addressed them accepted as a sovereign by their subjects and accustomed after centuries of muslim rule to paying tribute or revenue to alien rulers the zamindars were the agents by which imperial governments obtained the village resources unquote this is a this is a picture of a local zamindar which is printed on the cover of this book at that time the relationship shared by the feudal master and his subjects were more social in nature than official apart from being the owner of the land of the subjects the zamindar is the controller of social life the right of the subjects but the zamindars had to play a dual role he is considered as the king by the subjects on the other hand he is uh, uh, he is a mere tax giver to the mughal ruler to delhi or to the british government however in the film we see that gupi still delhi escapes his room where his father is sleeping in early dawn sitting by the side of the palace singing loudly the only song he knows and uh, the king is utterly disturbed by this by the sound created by gupi he orders his piyada bahar mein kaun chillata usko pakad ke bhitore le aao this is very funny sentence which have both hindi and bangla words john r maclen informs us that at that time the zamindars had the habit to employ non bengali uniform guards in their palaces so this sentence is also a historical also a signifier of historical truth gupi finds that the king is drinking milk he is surrounded by the by the courtiers who are clad in typical bengali dress and dhuti chador gupi is humiliated by the king the king destroys his tanpura he is banished from his kingdom this is the picture this is the picture of a local zamindar which is drawn in the style of kalighat painting and which bears some resemblances with the zamindar who is shown in the in the in the film uh, the the chador on the bare body the ornaments the mustache this is the picture which show, which shows gupi has come with the tanpura to the king this is the image of the king holding the tanpura just after this moment he destroys the tanpura and banishes gupi the banishment of gupi demands some critical attention from us the zamindars of the 18th or 19th century bengal employed various methods in punishing disobedient subjects physical coercion imprisonment seizing the property all kind of punishment were used by them these retributions were applied when the subject refused to pay rent or involved in theft murder or any kind of violent act but we should remember that gupi is not a murderer he has not stolen something any anything from anyone else he has not been engaged in any act of violence also what is his error what is his offense he has only disturbed the morning sleep of the king so we should ask this question is it a serious offense is this offense a serious enough to invite such a grave retribution like banishment from a village if we analyze the act from social and historical perspective it will be clear that the source of the king's sheer disgust about gupi lies in the sudden recognition of gupi's ambition for moving upwards in the social hierarchy the ambition which was visually represented by the tanpura the king just like the brahmins recognized the tanpura in gupi's hand and he was conscious about the ambition which is nurtured by the son of a poor grocer he is infuriated by sensing the ambition which is nurtured by gupi and he suddenly give the punishment of banishment and after the, after a period of public humiliation what i want to say is that in upendra kishor story this entire act of banishment the 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 role of the priests the role of the king is absent in upendra kishor story gupi himself takes shelter in the wood being reprimanded and discouraged by his father and the other herdsmen in the fields but shottojit ray replaces this act of self imposed banishment by the banishment by uh, through the uh, by the banishment of the state machinery not only the state machinery gupi's banishment is actualized by a joint force joint force of state machinery and priesthood shamanta tantra ebong dharma tantra it is very important these two aspects of rural life go hand by hand by actualizing the banishment of gupi 
Robert Travers commented that, I quote, in the large Hindu zamindaris of West Bengal, zamindars patronized Brahmin learning and piety, appealing to established norms of Hindu kingship, unquote. So, priesthood and zamindari were mutually dependent factors of rural life. It is very natural that Gupi, the son of a poor grocer, uh, is defeated by this joint force of priesthood and zamindari. It is a reality of feudal system, feudal society, which sets the principle obstacle in the actualization of his dream, in the fulfillment of his ambition. I have ended the first portion of my lecture and I am going to the second section, the dance of the ghosts. In the cinema, we see that Gupi and Bagha, Gupi meets Bagha in the deep wood. Bagha, who is Bagha? Bagha is a, is a counterpart of Gupi who shares the similar history of excommunication. And their meeting place is located on the outskirt of human society. It is in the deep wood, which is only populated by fierce animals like tiger and the ghosts. Interestingly, the tigers and the ghosts do not do any harm to Gupi and Bagha. The tiger ignores their presence and the ghosts welcome them in a unique manner. There are three major differences between the text written by Upendra Kishore and the film made by Shottajit, right? Regarding the entire episode of the appearance of the ghosts and their the, the, the boons, giving of the boons and the ghost dancings, what are the three major differences? Very important and very significant differences. First, in Upendra Kishore's story, Gupi and Bagha delivered their musical, uh, musical performance on the occasion of the marriage of the son of the king of the ghosts. But in the cinema, in the, in the film, the, this occasion is omitted. Second, in the story, the ghosts dance with the accompaniment of the music created by Gupi and Bagha. But in the, in the film, the ghosts dance of their own. Though the song, the, the song created by Gupi and Bagha uh, inspires their dance, but, they, but the, uh, for the rest of the moment of, the, uh, of their dancing, Gupi and Bagha remain silent observer or inactive or passive observer, nothing more than that. Ubendra Kishore describes the ghosts such as, I quote, Japsha Japsha Kalo Kalo, Oi Boro Boro Kijano Shop Gatshe, Opot Teke Muki Marte Legeche, Tade Chogulo Jolche, Jana Agune Bhata, Dadgulo Beruche, Jana Mulo Shar, unquote. So, naturally, this type of description is not suitable for a director to visually translate the ghosts on the screen. So, Shoktajitra had to create the appearance of the ghost, their mode of dancing, their mode of the physical movements of his own. If we concentrate on the appearance of the king of the ghost, we will find a topor or a typical Bengali crown on his head. He is wearing a sacred thread or a poite in his body, and he, he has a piece of cloth or a chador half rounded in his neck. Who is this ghost? Shoktajit himself identifies this king of ghosts as a Brombodoitto. Bangladesh Bhutir Raja. In an interview, he says that he is a Brahmodhito. What is a Brahmodhito? Brahmodhito is a ghostly incarnation of a, of a, of a dead Brahmin priest. So here is the irony. When a priest, when he is alive, he acts in a hostile manner to Gupi and Bhagam. But a priest, when dead, is benevolent to them. And what is the reason behind this sudden change of behavior? The reason is that the priest, when he is dead, he himself is marginalized from human society. He is distanced from human society through the annihilation of his physical body. For this reason, he does not find any, any reason to have grudge against these two and gives them the three magical boons, which eventually earn Gupi and Bagha the recognition of their talent on one hand and their honorable rehabilitation in human society on the other. Shottajitra divides the entire ghosts into four different classes. The first is the Raja Batsha or the kings. We observe six, six kings are there. One is from Pourani Kamal or mythical age. Second is from Buddhist era. Third is from Konishko's time. Fourth from Modrodesh, a country. Fifth, a Mughal king. And finally, a common king whose geographical and historical references are not made clear. So, by, by assembling this, these ghosts from various historical and geographical references, Shottajitra actually celebrates 
the multiple cultures and the multiple religions of India, the ethnical diversity of India is celebrated in the ghostly incarnations of these kings. Second comes the group of the Chasha Bhushu or the peasants. It consists of a Santal, a farmer, a Baul, a poor Muslim, a Behari Darwan or the Behari doorkeeper, and a Latial or a fighter with sticks. We all know that the beginning of the 19th century witnessed many tribal revolts and the revolts of the peasants against the British rulers and the local zamindars. Perhaps the Santal and the farmer were the helpless victims of the operations, of the operations by the state missionary. The Baul represents the marginalized section of rural people who believe in an alternative way of life, which is not sanctioned by the normative discourses of society. The Bihari, the, the Muslim, the poor Muslim farmer represents the lion share of the population of rural Bengal at that time. The Bihari gate man and the Latial, on the other hand, represent the forces of the Zamindar. They are the oppressive forces. So though all of the all of the ghosts who are grouped into this particular segment rep are represent the subaltern class, but there is a hint of conflict among themselves. This is the historical truth about them. Now comes the ghosts of the sahibs. Very interestingly, Shottojit Rai gives direct names of three of, 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 of uh, three of the ghosts. He names them as Warren Hastings, Robert Clive, Charles Cornwallis. These are the names directly taken from history. Apart from Hastings, Clive, and Cornwallis, there is a braggart, or what he calls in Bengali a chadia, a soldier, and an indigo planter. We all know about the about the degree of the oppression or the torture inflicted by these indigo planters to the rural people of Bengal at that time. And we all know that Hastings, Clive, Charles Cornwallis, were the one of were the primary architects of colonial enterprise in India, and the soldier, without whose help, the colonial enterprise would have not been possible in such a large country like India. In the sequence, the ghosts follow the farmers, so the oppressor follow the oppressed. As both of them are marginalized, there is no question of enmity among themselves. So Shrutpajitra converts Robert Clive, uh, Warren Hastings and Charles Cornwallis to the dancing ghosts. It's a very important thing to remember. Finally comes Naru Gopal, or the fat men, the overfed people, in Shottajit's own language. There is a Babu ear, there is a Babu Shohure, or urban, there is a Baniya, there is a Purut, or priest, a headmaster, and a Padri. So uh, we all know that Bunkim Chandra wrote a very famous essay called Babu, which delineates the different classes and activities of those Babus. The year Babu is perhaps a ghost, ghostly incarnation of, of a court, one of the courtiers of the Zamindar. The Shohure Babu, the Arban Babu, was perhaps the inhabitants of Calcutta in his lifetime. The Baniya or the, or the non Bengali priest represents that section of people who managed to accumulate wealth with the help of the colonial economy at that time. The Purut or the priest, there is again a note of irony. He does not have any grudge against Kupi and Bagha because he himself is marginalized like themselves. The headmaster holds a stick on his hand. He is habitual in inflicting corporal punishments to his students. And the Padri holds the Bible and goes to the other, other figures of, of his group and tries to convince them about the lessons of Christianity. So all these figures have particular historical role in this entire dancing episode. These are the artworks which were created by Shottajit Rai while shooting the entire sequence. And Shottajit Rai identifies four different types of sound sourced from different instruments for these four groups. He, he instructed about the mode of dancing, modes of dancing. He instructed that the kings will follow the classical style, the peasants will follow the folk style, the sahibs will uh, show their inclination for Western style, and the fat men will make funny movements. They will not dance as such. And the entire episode is divided into seven stages. In the first stage, the groups will appear one by one. Only the kings and the peasants are dancing. In the second stage, the kings and the peasants continue their dancing. The sahibs start interacting with each other. The Baniya still maintain the distance among themselves. 
In the third stage, all figures of all groups are dancing. Fifth stage, the kings, the peasants, the sahibs, and the baniyas are fighting among themselves. In the sixth, uh, in the fifth stage, all of them die due to war, conflict, murder, illness, decrepitude, too much drinking. In the sixth stage, the ghosts get another life. In the seventh stage, they start dancing again in different columns. There is a mention of different causes of the deaths of the ghosts. Very important. The death of the ghosts, such as the mother, illness, decrepitude, and too much drinking. These are omitted in the film, but these account for the sheer historicity in Rai's concern while designing the entire episode. Rai commented, I quote, the story it tells, it means the dancing sequence tells, is definitely an adult story. But children enjoy it for the dancing and all the things that happen on court. Now I am coming to the last segment of my presentation. The song as liberating force. How Shotojitrai uses song or the musical forms as liberating forces in, the, in this film. We have seen that Shotojit used the different forms or musical forms as a metaphor or cultural signifier to the different classes of people. Now I am going to show how Shotojit use a particular form of music as a mode of liberation, liberation from various factors we are going to discuss. We know that after getting the three boons from the, from, from the king of the ghosts, Gupi and Bagha meet a real Ustad on the next day. After, after finishing their meal, they saw that an Ustad is going to the, uh, to the king, uh, to the court of the Shundi to participate in the musical contest to be held in that court. He is dressed with the tupi, sherwani, royal shoes, shawl, medals on his body, ring, and he is accompanied by a tabla player, carriers of palanquin, guards, bearers of hookah, servants, connoisseurs of shamusdar, etc. So the entire entire ambience signify the the royal status which is enjoyed by the ustad and his and and the and the fellow men and the material wealth of them when. Gupi and Baga, after getting the information from the Ustad, reach the, the court of Shundi. They are, they are surprised by the different forms of singing which are performed by the, by the Ustads at that time. Khayal in Moddhuloi, Druttan, Dhrupadi Kirtan, Tarana, Kajri, Alap in Vilumbit Khayal, all these forms of music which are performed by the Ustads. But quite contrary to their expectation, Gupi and Bhaka sees that the king is getting bored by these by this uh, musical festival. Bhaga had to give a stroke to his drum to awaken the king from this untimely sleep. This moment can be interpreted as a very significant instant for Gupi, who brings about an utter which brings about an utter disillusionment, a disillusionment about the nature and effect of classical music on common listeners. Gupi never imagined that the particular form of music on which he wanted to construct his identity, through which he wished to achieve those things which were prohibited to a common man of his own class, could appear so lifeless, inanimate, dull, lustreless in the royal court. He suddenly realizes that he aspired something which is more ornamental in nature than being vitally connected to the life and society. There is an unbridgeable gap between the test of common man and the musical practices of these ustads. I am quoting Rabindranath Thakur. Rabindranath Thakur observed that just like a priest who claims more reverence than the God himself, these ustads demand more veneration than music itself. Thakur names it as the musical politics, administered by the bureaucratic ustads who had dwindled the creative space into a field of wrestling. Gupi is now convinced about the impossibility of attainment of his desire of becoming Gopinath's Ustad. Rather, Gupi abandons his ambition to become a Gopinath Ustad. He wants to be a mere musician who has a mesmerizing effect on common man. While getting the chance of performance, Gupi develops his own style of singing, the style which gives equal importance to the lyric and the tune, 
the style that is marked with simplicity in both these aspects of a song, a style which enables Guppy to express his heart or genuine feelings unpretentiously to the commoners in musical terms. Guppy firmly averts that Eje Shureri Bhasha, Chonderi Bhasha, Praneri Bhasha, Anonderi Bhasha, Bhasha Amon Kothavale, Bojere Shokole, Ucha Nicha Choto Boroshoman. Gupi's song is accessible to all. Everyone belonging to a society is able to enjoy it. Gupi makes his song able to communicate with all, irrespective of their position in the hierarchical society. When the practitioners of classical songs are anxious to retain their purity, exclusivity, aristocracy, Gupi delivers a message of ideal coexistence, which he learned from the groups of the ghosts dancing in that wood. The sequence of the dancing of the ghosts enabled Gupi and Bhava to envisage a society which celebrates coexistence and inclusivity after all conflicts and classes, clashes. The biographer of Shukhajitra observes, I quote, the first public performance by the duo at a music contest held by the good king of Shundi far away from their native village provides the occasion for an open-hearted statement of human fraternity, unquote. I have almost finished my presentation. Now I am going to briefly summarize my arguments, the points which I have tried to make in this presentation. First, Gupi, the son of a poor grocer, was banished from his village by the joint force of feudalism and priesthood because of nurturing an ambition which was not appropriate to his class, social class. Second, in the deep forest, Gupi finds his counterpart in Bagha, who also shares his experience of expulsion from human society. Third, in that forest, the duo finds the community of the ghosts who uphold an alternative form of living, which is based on the ideals of coexistence and benevolence. And from these ghosts, Gupi and Bapa acquired the magical tools to mesmerize human beings. Fourth, finally reaching the court of Shundi, Gupi and Bapa realized that the hierarchical structure of human society is also reflected in the form of classical music. This particular musical form as a cultural product is by nature ornamental, artificial, and disconnected from the larger section of society. Finally, by abandoning his previous desire to become Gupinatostad, Gupi develops a different form of music which does not contain any sign of class or caste in it. Though there are elements of classical music, both in Indian and Western in Gupi's song, but his songs cannot be qualified as pure musical, classical music or pure folk music. In his songs, both the ingredients of classical and folk songs were freely mixed by Shottojit Rai. By amalgamating all musical forms, by annihilating the differentiation of various forms of music, rather by declassifying music as a cultural product, Shottojit Rai celebrates a moment of liberation, liberation from the hierarchical structure of human society, liberation from humiliation, liberation from oppression, and most importantly, liberation of music as an art form. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. I have completed my presentation. And it is up to you, Ashinda. Thank you, Sarmik. It's a wonderful, wonderful speech. Uh, we we know this a movie with design Rakhabai, the children film or an allegorical film, sometimes political allegory, but your insight uh, regarding the local issues, local color, the historical perspective, it's a new piece of, or, or the new opening or the new research area. So you have done a wonderful, wonderful uh, job uh, in structuring your lecture. Uh, it's really, really thought provoking. So we look forward to questions uh, asked by the audience. So there is one question already um, with me. So I'm just reading out the questions referring to the songs used in the film, which are based on the structured ragas, yet appearing going beyond. Apparently, going beyond was there a conscious translation and hybridity by rape? Definitely, this is a conscious 
digression. This is the point which I'm trying to make. This is a conscious digression. Shottujitra is declassifying de music. He is negating the different forms. He is negating the class. So this this act of mixing it is the it is a contribution of modernity. It's a, another factor which which is a different session to discuss. So I am uh, I am explaining it very briefly. This is the contribution of modernity. This is a contribution of the that type of modernity which was shared by Shottujit Rai. He has the power and he had the confidence to mix all kind of forms. And most in interestingly, this is a very important musical experiment which takes place in Ore Halla Raja Shena Kora Juddho Kori Kori Kita Bol. In that song, the classical, the ingredients of classical music and the ingredients of folk music were mixed with each other. It is a very, very powerful and very successful experiment. Raga Bhupali was mixed with a with a folkish tune which is in, in Bengal. So this is definitely a conscious attempt which was made by Shottujit Rai. Not and this attempt not only has the aesthetic value, this attempt has tremendous socio-political value. This is uh, uh, according to myself. Uh, there is one question, uh, Shomik. Uh, do you think the huge time span employed for the host dancing impeded the pace of the movie a bit? No, the no, no, definitely it? not. It is very and uh, no, no, no. It is, it, it is, it is contributing the movie. It is, it is a major factor through which the historicity of the movie is constructed. So it, it has to be there. It has to be there. The entire episode, though it may appear uh, uh, boring for some some children. When when I as a child observed the movie, I sometimes wondered what is going on. It is sometimes it is long, but but now I can understand that it was planfully done. And it, it is a comment on contemporary society. It is the it is a visual comment of contemporary society, which was made by Shottujitra, and it was very conscious and it's very important and integral part of the movie. Okay, another question uh, for Shomik: uh, That can any adaptation or remake match the quality of the masterpiece? What's your opinion? Definitely, definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. Definitely. The, one, 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 one. Best. <laughs> okay. Is the ghost in the film construct the European dreams of Sutojit? Ask my almost of two. I I have I have answered this question in my presentation. It is not the European. Uh, uh, utopian in the sense that uh, uh, that uh, the, the sense of coexistence or inclusivity. If we if we analyze that in that term, perhaps it it may appear that sometimes Shukritra was uh, planning some or envisaging utopian society by developing these ghosts. But it it has uh, some strong historical basis. It can be analyzed like that. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, just your, just your... my camera is for some reason not working. I apologize, but I have tried my level best. This is a Mac, uh, and I'm not very familiar with Macs. Uh, it was working fine, uh, given so, some talks on this, but you are very clear. Uh, your audio is very, very clear. But think is that. Uh, can you wait for some time? You can take both of the first, then, then uh, to you. Uh, so you want me to try getting the? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Then I can uh, take both of the first. Then uh, just uh, work on your uh, camera. Then we will go to you. Okay. Okay, so we are, we have Mr. Gautam Ghosh with us, Rocket Film Director. Uh, both of the needs of uh, introduction, no epithet is enough for him. Uh, we uh, from the organizers 
far we uh, we uh, really apologize that we are calling you uh, before uh, mr uh, professor onish kumar sir because he is having problems in his uh, camera so that's why gautam goth was born on 24th of july 1950 in calcutta he started making document documentaries in 1973 He took active part in group theatre movement in Calcutta. Once he dedicated some time as a photojournalist, he made his first documentary, New Art, in 1973, followed by Hungry Autumn. Since then, he has made a number of feature films and documentaries: Ma Bhumi, 1980, Telugu. Dakhol in 1981, Par in Hindi 1984, Antur Joli Jatra in Bengali in 1987, Otano Dirmaji in Bengali 1992, Dakha in Bengali 2001, Abar Arunne in Bengali 2003, Meeting a Milestone, a documentary on India's Sanai Mastro, Ustad Bismillah Khan, Monir Manush. Feature film on the great Fakir of Bengal, 2010. Sunno Angko in 2013. Uh, Raghir the Wayfarers in Hindi, 2019, etc. He has been awarded various awards in both national and international level. So, Gautam, the uh, floor is for yours. So, I. Uh, The topic is well, you know, good evening, everybody. Yeah. Uh, outset, I must congratulate and thank Ramkrishna Mission Vidyapeet for organizing uh, this session on Manita, uh, our beloved Shukri Tree. Uh, but today, uh, I'm not uh, uh, really in a mood to uh, discuss for a long because uh, Shomitra is very critical. is fighting for his life at the hospital bed uh, so it's very very difficult for me uh, to really continue a long session uh, uh, this evening uh, and for your information uh, today is also the birthday of uh, shubhrudo mitro the lieutenant of shutrujit ray in in shaping up his cinematographic visuals and images uh, since pocket pachali uh, actually much have been uh, written on ray many books articles and there were so many seminars and sessions on ray's work i remember uh, i was a young filmmaker i just completed my first feature film mabhumi which was shown in 1980 ifi where manik dev was also present and uh, that was uh, 25 years of pothe pachali there was a wonderful seminar uh, uh all the important filmmakers sham benegal adul gopal krishnan ms satu and many others and it was moderated by chidarand dash gupta and i was one of the speakers uh, as a young filmmaker so you know Uh, people have been discussing on ray and his films his creative work since long but what happens with a great creative artist he creates something multi layered so you discover some layer some day with the course of time so that's why this great artist great creative artists uh, they are almost immortal and you know you can bring them back their work and like you know some of the esteemed speakers spoke about his work in socio economic uh, perspective and also you, you can discuss so many things actually uh, i had the opportunity of making a, a long documentary on shubhajit ray in 1990 it, it, it took 2 years to complete 97 to 99 and it was premiered in venice and uh, where i rediscovered ray in a way 
because you know uh, uh, Ray's wife Vijay Roy and uh, Bodhi and Babu Shundip Roy uh, really uh, helped me a lot. Lot means you know they opened Ray's study for my shoot and for my study and all that. And it was uh, Ray, uh, was uh, it was a couple of years after his demise, and I started rediscovering Ray because you know some films were already made on Ray. So I thought, how do I approach to this great master and made it make a comprehensive film on his work? Then I thought of uh, while you know looking at his books, his studies. I've been there several times meeting him. I thought, you know, let me go through his uh, Kero Khata, which my opinion is a kind of a workstation for Ray. Kero Khata is a kind of, it's a, it's a, actually he uh, was inspired by Shukumar Roy. Shukumar Roy had a Kero Khata. Uh, he used to call it Paltu uh, Khata, Hijibich Khata, and all these kind of things. But it's a basically an account book, uh, exercise book, you know, which is, it has a hard uh, red cover. That was famous uh, red book of uh, Ray. And it started from Oporajit. Uh, the original uh, script of Pothar Pachali, I didn't find. Perhaps a part of it is in uh, French archive. But Marinda never used uh, that kind of kerukata for Pakhi Bachchan. While uh, studying his uh, kerukata and his books, his writings, I found uh, his preparation, the, uh, the, the pre preparatory period, his homework was incredible. He came into the creative film absolutely well prepared. Uh, and you, we all know about his childhood and uh, how he suffered after the death of Shukumar Roy and their business collapsed. And uh, they had a very difficult life. And his mother, Shukrova Roy, was an incredible lady. He induced so many things in child Ray. And Ray's mind was prepared with good literature, music, uh, painting, illustration wonderful drawing. So from from the very uh, sort of prime age, his mind was prepared. He was looking for something, something wonderful, something uh, great. Actually, it was actually it's running in their family because the family was a very illustrious family uh, uh, during the Bengal Renasa. And if you look at the effort of Upendra Kishore when he brought brought out Shandesh for young people. Uh, basically, Shandesh was meant for uh, young and teenagers and also uh, little children. Uh, and he wanted to combine science and art in Shandesh and to prepare a, a child's mind with some scientific ideas. That was a, a sort of intention of Ray family. And uh, Satyajit Ray followed that. He nurtured himself in that lineage. Just imagine a, a little boy, his uh, 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 sort of reading, you know, bedtime reading at night was a kind of a notation books of Bach, of Schubert, of Mozart. And he used to read and he could sort of, you know, listen all the arrangement of the violin group and the flute, all the horn groups. You know, he said and, and it's written that it was a great, great bedtime reading for me. So he was prepared. And then, of course, Shantinikatan opened up his eyes because Shantinikatan was a very open place. And he had a great teacher like Nandalal, Boshu, Vinod Bihari, Ram Kinkor. All of them were there. But, you know, they 
learned something again wonderful. He read the books on cinema. So he was prepared. And when he came back as an artist, as an illustrator, he was he was given a great opportunity by Dilip Gupta uh, of Signet Press. And we had seen unbelievable book covers and illustration, which was completely revolutionary made by Ray. So before Pothir Panchali, he was prepared for himself uh, to pursue uh, his talent in, in this creative field. And I'm sure that he thought that cinema is the right kind of expression for him. Because in cinema, you have literature, you have elements of literature, uh, visual art, and music, everything. So Ray was absolutely, and also he had some incredible, you know, connection, like a connection with Jean Renoir, when Renoir made a river here. And he had given a great advice to Ray that, uh, Look elements from your own land and people. You'll find something because original Ray once thought of making Jinder Bundi's A uh, Prisoner of Zender's uh, uh, Indian version, which later on Papunda made as Jinder Bundi. Uh, but you know, uh, Ray. I think Renoir's uh, talk to Ray was was a great moment for him. And of course, watching Bicycle Thieves. These stories we all know. But uh, let me uh, sort of narrate my experience with the Kheru Khata. Actually, from Aparajita onwards, he used to write scripts short by short with a lot of illustration in one side, a full script. But on the other side of the page, you find illustration of some book illustration of uh, some, uh, you know, some design or set design, oh, so many things, even oh, little sketches of uh, aspirant actors. So it's something incredible. And whatever, you know, whatever, you know, comes in his mind while working on a script, you should keep a note. And that notes are very, very interesting. And you find in each and every script, all kinds of notes all kinds and uh, and uh, when he started composing films uh, music music for his films uh, uh, i think uh, from dimkonna onwards in obijan's uh, small little book you find the first phrase of the title music written on 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 the on the on the on, on the first page itself so perhaps you know in obijan ray's mind was working musically how to create the movement so that's why you know he had written the phrase right right on, on the first page like that you if you go and i went i really made a journey through his uh Kero Katas, which is incredible which has so many things including his personal expression because ray never had a personal diary uh, he had written some books about his childhood days about opus uh, 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 and so many things, but he never had a, a personal diary. Perhaps those Kherokhatas had some kind of personal expression. I remember there was a beautiful uh, line drawing uh, of, of, of a river and a silhouette of Tagore. And below, below that beautiful sketch, a sketch on, on, that, on the Kherokhata, he has written Akon Tomake Chai. Now I need you. Perhaps he was remembering Tagore in his birth centenary and also planning to make a film on documentary on Tagore and short stories uh, which he filmed uh, for uh, Din Kumna. Uh, and he had many personal expressions you find that uh, I, I have noticed in his Kero Kata that uh, after a few years, used to write, Ami Janina, I don't know. It's a very interesting uh, and intriguing question for an artist. Ray, who knew so much, he was very humble, but he really, he knew too much. Still, he was asking himself, Ami Janina. Means I'm still searching. That was a search of a great artist. 
And Ray had a great hunger of learning, which is unbelievable. I, I give a very interesting example from his uh, Sadgati uh, book, Sadgati script book, where, you know, uh, you find in one page he's trying to uh, practice Devnagari syllables, Shorabarno and Banjanmarno syllables. And after a few pages, it's unbelievable a full scene written in immaculate, beautiful Devanagari. So that was Ray, you know, quietly he could learn things. Uh, and uh, he was always, you know, doing his own research. I remember while shooting the film in his room, I found uh, uh, a very interesting book called uh, uh, by Hooker uh, on Himalayas, a Himalayan journal. Uh, I was wondering why uh, this book uh, on Manik Das table uh, at the corner of his table. I'm sure that this book, you know, he bought while making a documentary on Sikkim. Well, you know, it was a book, uh, by film on Sikkim, but he wanted to know the entire journey of Hooper. Uh, he had such, a, such an incredible thirst for learning. And, uh, uh, well, you know, I met him several times and uh, while making an adda, simple adda, uh, he was he was he was you know laughing, uh, cracking jokes, but uh, making some illustration uh, for perhaps for Shondesh because you know he had to do a lot of illustration for Shondesh. So Ray was like that, you know, he was uh, so. So a multitasking person, you know, he could do so many things together. And I was always wondering, I asked Ray, my Manita, how you manage time? He laughed and said, oh, no, 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 it's nothing, you know, I just concentrate and things come out. So it was, you know, basically because of his background, because of his study for so many years and, and his continuous learning process which he maintained till his last breath, which is fascinating. And also was so conscious. He was basically a realist. Of course, uh, you find a lot of fantasy elements in his films, but basically he was a realist. And he was highly uh, conscious person and uh, a humanist. So that reflects in his films. And he also criticized. Uh, superstition. He also criticized uh, all kinds of medieval uh, sort of uh, uh, backwardness uh, in his it is in three four films and also in many films there are references. And he reflected time, made so many kinds of films. And uh, if you go through his Kherokata, you find so many things, especially uh, in the later period, uh, immaculate design of uh, the costumes, sets, especially when he started making uh, films in color, Satranj Ke Khilari or Gore Bayre, you find everything, uh, sort of every drawing is in color and with footnotes for art directors, for costume designer, for other, uh, for cameramen, everything. Well, it's a, it's a fantastic journey for me uh, to de rediscover Ray and his work process. And uh, I believe uh, Ray will remain uh, in our culture, in our history for many, many years to come. Because more you see Ray, more you. Uh, read his uh, literary work and read about him, you get fascinated at how prolific he was and what a talent, what a talent and, and how he pursued his sad talent, his sort of work with always in a great process of learning. Uh, so 
let's remember Ray and let's hope the uh, fast recovery of Ray's favorite actor, Shomitruda. Uh, really, my voice is choking. I don't know because why he's suffering a lot. And we had, uh, we, we, were, we were together in Ray's place, had a wonderful time. Uh, so I'm sure that he will recover. And will do again so many wonderful work. So Maringda was a great teacher. I remember when I had a plan on the Juri Yatra, he said, my God, from our Beresh house, so what is it? I said, Maringda, I'm trying. I've written a script for a very good, very good, but try to understand that there is a difference between uh, the, uh, the literary image and cinematic image. So you have to uh, transfer Kamal Babu's literary images to your own understanding with your own perception to cinematic images. That's, that's the most important thing. And, you know, I'm sure that I, I wish you all the best that then you can really uh, bring a lot of elements in your film on the Juli Yatra. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. I can't hear you. Hello. Hello. I can't hear. Once I can hear you. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. If there is uh, any question, so uh, uh, quickly, any yeah, Gautam Dutt, quickly, you can uh, ask questions to Gautam Dutt, Gautam Ghosh. Uh, you can write your questions in the chat box. Yes, any question? Any question, please? Any question? Friends, please. any question, please? Our next speaker, Unustu Basu from USA, he is uh, online. Gautunda, once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank for you very much. Sorry, you know, I couldn't yeah. continue because today I'm extremely disturbed. Let's yes, hope for the best. We understand. We understand. We are, let us all pray. Let us all pray. Pray for Shobhitruda. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Okay, Gautunda. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, what is to pass you our next speaker? Our honorable speaker, what is to pass you? He is presently an associate professor in English, media, and cinema studies and criticism at the University of Illinois at urbana Sampel. He's the author of Hindutva as Political Monotheism, which is published from Duke University Press 2020. Bollywood in the age of new media, the geo televisual aesthetic, Edinburgh 2010 and the co-editor of the volumes of Intermedia in South Asia, the fourth screen published by Ruthless in 2012, and Figurations in Indian Film, published by Paul Grave Macmillan in 2013. His essays on film, media, culture, philosophy, and politics have appeared in various anthologies and journals like Boundary 2, Semiotic Inquiry, Journal of Human Rights, Postscript, South Asian History and Culture, Postmodern Culture, and Critical Quarterly. He was the executive producer of Bengali feature, Harvard, 
in 2005 which won the Indian National Award for the best regional film. He has worked as a screenwriter for film and television, having recently co-written the oncoming of Hindi feature film Najarband 2020, which is officially entry at the Guzal International Film Festival, where it is having its world premiere. Basu is currently working on a book entitled Neruvian Cinema, followed Bombay and Bengal, 1955 and 1962. His title of his speech today is Sotujit Ray and the question of Bengali cinema in film fair 1951 to 1965. So, Professor Basu, so it's your time, your turn. Please enlighten this area to us. Uh, thank you, Ashim. Uh, I would like to begin once, you know. Uh, by expressing my deep concern about Shomitra Chattopadhyay and what Gautam Dha just said. Uh, I hope and pray that he uh, gets through this. Uh, today I will talk about the arrival of Shotajit Ray in the Indian and Bengali film scenarios of the 1950s and early 1960s. That is, in a sense, I will speak about what Ray as a phenomenon uh, meant for an aspiring, uh, transforming Indian cinema, as well as an aspiring and transforming Bengali cinema. Uh, so both in terms of what actually happened and uh, in terms of possibilities that um, the Ray phenomenon gave birth to, uh, but these possibilities were not uh, realized. Now, this is a story all of us know in various degrees. Well, at least we know the headlines. But I will talk about these things from a slightly unusual vantage point. Um, one can call this a certain cosmopolitan and uh, anglophone Bombay point of view. How was Bombay, or at least, uh, um, you know, uh, cultural elite of Bombay looking at the rise of Ray and uh, his subsequent impact on uh, Bengali cinema uh, during that time? Now, this was an assembled elite point of view of the magazine Filmfare, which began publication in 1952 and is still in print. But why Filmfare? Why visit this archive? I will get into that question. Uh, but first, for those who are not familiar with the history, let me provide you with a glimpse of what the Filmfare platform was in the 1950s and 60s. It was strikingly different from uh, the film magazines and tabloid culture we are familiar with today. Now, I don't read Filmfare nowadays, but I would imagine that the Filmfare was of today is strikingly different from the Filmfare that was uh, in the first two decades of its existence. So in its inaugural issue, uh, 7th March uh, 1952, Filmfare declared itself to be the first serious effort in Indian film journalism. Now, but what was this seriousness of purpose? It was a broad-based, complicated enterprise, uh, but I'm going to highlight some, like, three key aspects. One, first of all, it was to find an aesthetic and a mission for a new Indian cinema for the new republic. That is a cinema, an Indian cinema, that would be in the spirit of the constitutional revolution of 1950. A cinema that would respond to international post-war artistic developments in the medium as seen during the first international uh, Indian International Film Festival 
1951. And indeed, a cinema that could merge with the Nehruvian socialist ethos of development and national destiny, especially you know, with the second five-year plan of 1956. The project was therefore to merge a mode of uh, viewership with a new credo of citizenship. Two, so accordingly, Filmfare's efforts were to set up new channels of exchange between the three major centers in Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras. It was expected that all these separate cultural and cinematic traditions would combine to produce a paradigmatic national form and aesthetic. Unlike nowadays, filmmakers, film critics, and industry leaders were regularly writing essays and reports on the state of cinema in the Filmfare pages. So, you know, nowadays you don't have a uh, you know, big uh, Bollywood producers or filmmakers writing entire essays in uh, film magazines, but that was more or less the norm during that time. So in Filmfare, you know, you had Chetan Anand, K. Abbas, Bimal Roy from Bombay writing. Uh, you had uh, powerful South Indian studio heads like S.S. Vasan or uh, A.V. Mayappan from the South, they were also writing. And uh, then figures like B.N. Sarkar, Deboki Bosch, Sholil Chodhuri, Robi Shankar, and indeed Shotojit Rai from Calcutta. All of them were writing in Filmfare. Filmfare would thus regularly solicit articles and interviews from a galaxy of personages across the world as well. Uh, figures like Alexander Korta, Fritz Lang, Alfred Hitchcock, or Gregory Peck. Uh, now, Shotojit Rai and the Ray phenomenon featured regularly and prominently in these discussions. Ray's films were prominently reviewed and his international success discussed and celebrated. Filmfare published its review of Pothet Bachali on 13th April 1956. The review entitled one Man Renaissance was effusive and called Pothir Bachali a great film in the wasteland of Indian cinema. Now, we should note that it was published before the film became an international sensation at the Cannes Film Festival. Mary Seaton would write a series of articles comparing Ray's work with international masters of cinema uh, in the late 50s in filmfare. Now, Filmfare would report uh, Ray's important international engagements. On April the 2nd, 1965, the magazine would carry an interview between two greats of world cinema, Ray himself and the Polish director Andrzej Wajda. Three. Now, let me come to another set of operations that were central to Filmfare's mission as self-appointed guardian of Indian cinema and why Ray was important to that uh, business as well. Filmfare was the industry's principal platform of advocacy when it came to government policy. You know, matters like film censorship, theater construction limits, uh, permits, foreign exchange, raw stock quotas, etc. The magazine periodically reminded the Indian government that films were being taxed at a greater rate than prostitution or horse racing. We have to remember that this was the 50s, that is. Uh, this was a period of a powerful, conservative Gandhian uh, moral aversion for uh, the cinema as a medium itself. And, you know, it was considered a public vice corrupting the morals of the, the youth in particular. Now, just to take two names, Binoba Bhavi wanted to nationalize cinema, and C. Raja Gopalchari wanted to ban it altogether. So now in this scenario, in order to have a negotiating position, 
uh, Filmfare was aware of one principal task. It had to make cinema respectable. It had to make cinema respectable as an honest trade, as well as a bona fide art form. So one can understand this is exactly why Ray was an exemplary figure. He was a recognized master of world cinema, and he and his films were great cultural ambassadors in that high era of Nehruvian internationalism. But that was not all. From a practical point of view, Ray's films earned significant foreign exchange from world markets. At least they could earn significant uh, foreign exchange if the red tapes were removed. The government thus was urged to promote not just Ray's films, but Ray's kind of cinema. A 1959 editorial stated that a fabulous sum of $200,000 had been offered by an American distributor for the circuit release of Opu Shankar. In the same breath, 200,000 uh, was a significant amount of money in those days. In the same breath, uh, the editorial demanded that a government run agency on the lines of Unitalia or Uni Japan be set up to promote artistic Indian films abroad. So all these demands rode on Ray's shoulders. So let's sum up, uh, you know, the filmfare. Uh, mission. India needed an axiomatic national form by which the nation, people of the nation, could converse amongst themselves. It was assumed that India's cinema could be truly international only if it was resolutely national, that is, firmly rooted in Indian cultural traditions. And Ray was a perfect example of that. Now, in this slide, we have to speak about a Ray effect. Uh, we can see two things. One, an Indian artistic cinema movement had to gather around Ray. It had to gain international prestige. Two, while commercial cinema could not be expected to follow Ray, it could be touched by the Ray, Ray effect and become more realistic, more plausible. It could acquire a sobriety of presentation in terms of economy and technical finesse. Uh, in, the, in late 1956, after Pothir Patali, Filmfare was declaring, uh, again in an editorial, that as far as universal acceptance is concerned, even Raj Kapoor's Awara, you know, 1951 release, blockbuster hit at home, and a sensation uh, overseas in uh, USSR, Middle East, East Europe, and Africa. Even Awara could not fit the bill, quote, fit the bill anymore. So the model had shifted. Such ponderings in the late 50s and early 60s were inevitably accompanied by the key question in Filmfare. When would Ray take the next logical step in his career and make his Hindi film for the All India market? But was Ray at that point even interested in doing that? Was the so-called artistic revolution and it's inspired and instigated by him a potentially Indian one or a resolutely Bengali one? Now, let us turn to that question gradually. And so we move on to the question of uh, the state of Bengali cinema between 19, roughly 1955 and 1965. The partition of 1947 had resulted in a loss of almost 40% of the core audience of Bengali cinema. The event had damaged the industry in Calcutta much more severely than the extent to which the loss of West Pakistan had uh, affected Bombay. Calcutta would also rapidly lose ground to Madras. Just to give you an example, Bengal had released a record 62 feature films in 1949, while the still fledgling industries in the South had delivered 21 in Tamil, 
and seven films in Telugu. So this was 1949. Flash forward to 1965. The annual Bengali film was now down to 30, while the Tamil and Tel Telugu numbers had climbed to 56 and 50. This process, as we know, of process of relative decline would continue over the decades uh, up to the present moment. Partition aside, the other important point was that the literary reformist template of the Calcutta bilingual was rapidly losing eminence in Indian mass markets of the early 50s. So, you know, when you think about the great days of new theater, you're talking about films like um, Devdash or Vidyapati made in Bengal, made in Calcutta, uh, bilingual, starring major stars like uh, Prithviraj Kapoor or uh, K.L. Saigal or Kanon Devi and being released all over. Uh, so, but that format of, you know, uh, having classic Bengali literature and translating it onto the screen and, you know, uh, that getting widespread acclaim and acceptance, that model was faltering in the uh, late 40s and early 50s. So new theaters closes by the middle of the 50s, but before that it had stacked up a telling list of Hindi flops, Anjangar, uh, Manzoor, Naya Safar, and Bakul. All these films uh, were not no longer working. The general film, a Bengali film culture after independence, apart from radical IPTA inspired efforts, you know, these were stray ones like Chinnamul, Nimai Ghosh, 1950, or Ritti Ghatak's then unreleased debut feature, Nagori, which was made in um, 1952, but of course released two decades later. Uh, so Bengali cinema initially followed the same trends. The dominant genre was undeniably the Sharad Chandra model of the reformist social. Uh, and then there were biographies of great people like uh, Michael Modushan, Dott, Modushudan Dotto, Bidda Shagod, etc. Then you had uh, nationalist histories like uh, Hemen Gupta's two very famous films, Bhulinai and Bialish. Then you had devotional or pilgrimage films like Nila Chole Mahaprabhu or uh, Mahaprasthaner Pathe. And a rich vein of cerebral comedies and farces like uh, Borjatri, uh, Pasher Bari, etc. These films were largely studio bound, low budget. Uh, dramatic e evocations depended on artful dialogue in humble but noble settings uh, instead of like, you know, grand movements and attractions across big canvases. For instance, what you were seeing in the Bombay films of Shorab Modi, for instance. <coughs> um, so the, the dispensation after new theaters uh, between 1955 and 1965 was one of major transformations for Bengali cinema. Uh, there were in, there was increasing prestige in the national and international uh, so, you know stages with Ray as central figure. On the other hand, there was a settling of industrial realities, uh, commercial industrial realities that sort of wavered between uh, survival and regional prosperity. So let us, let us put it bluntly. This was the period in which Calcutta became a regional center of Indian cinema, rather than one of the two national ones. There was a gradual process uh, of, uh, you know, psychological acceptance of this decline. Uh, so if, you, if you're talking about 1955, let's say, uh, not so long ago, barely 10, 10 years ago, uh, new theaters made films with all India stars like Saigal that were released across the subcontinent from Burma to Afghanistan. Uh, now, there were enough people, and I'll illustrate that, who still thought for a while 
that those glory days would return. Uh, on top of that, there were some like Finfair's Bengali, Bengal correspondent, Shorod Shengupto. And Shorod Shengupto, along with Chidananda Dashgupto and Kobita Sharkar, these three were the figures who wrote most articles on uh, Bengali cinema and Filmfare. All of them belonged to a new generation of film critics who had emerged from the film society movement. Now, Shorod Shengupto thought that Bengal, like compared to 1945, uh, he was very optimistic. He thought Bengal could do even better. Uh, it could restore the all India popularity of the Calcutta bilingual film in time. You know, this is this was just a passing phase. But on top of that, it would also Calcutta would give birth to what he calls the Calcutta New Wave or the artistic revolution in, in international markets, with Shotojit Rai as prime star in a constellation of new young directors. So this list would include Tapon Shina, Rithik Ghatok, Rinal Shain, of course, but also others like Barin Shaha, Rajan Tarotar, Torun Mojumdar, and some names, actually quite a few names, that have been obscured by time. Anyway, the point was that the Calcutta New Wave, inspired by Ray, would be an international sensation like Italian new realism of Rossellini, Di Sica, and Fellini, or the post-war Jap Japanese cinema of Ozu, Kurosawa, Misoguchi. I think it is fair to say in hindsight that this did not happen. But there was considerable enthusiasm in the filmfare pages and in Bombay film circles in the years following Ray's spectacular rise. This was the period in which Raj Kapoor or V. Shantaram would produce Bengali films, Bombay would organize a Ray Film Festival in 1960. Industry stalwarts like Dilip Kumar and Raj Kapoor would be instrumental in following that, that up with the Bengali Film Festival in uh, 1961. So let us turn to that story. Commercially, the biggest shift in years was the phenomenal rise of two classic movie stars in Uttam Kumar and Shuchitra Shet. The pair starred in a series of blockbuster romances to become uh, figural expressions of a new wave of post-partition urbanity and uh, nuclear, uh, nucleated desires. Moinak uh, Bishash has uh, written brilliantly on this. Uh, the new urban scene and conjugal desire between Uttam and Shuchitra, uh, according to uh, was marked by these utopian lines of flight from the regimented grounds of the feudal extended family, joint family. Uh, so from, from you know, th that those kind of scenarios, scenario, the short Chandra kind of uh, domestic scenarios, to dream worlds far from a city now overrun by refugees. So this aura of the spectral couple was cinematically consolidated by a stylized, soft focus, black and white cinematography, dreamy backlit close-ups and uh, other effects. The films had a more naturalistic acting style marked by psychological signatures of a new novel-based realism. So, and this kindness is this new forms of loneliness, these new forms of loneliness and desire were, of course, you know, brought into expression by a new generation of cinematographers, uh, Dinin Mukto, for instance, um, uh, or Ojoy uh, Kaur, new generation of cinematographers and musicians. So, Shorat Chandra could, would continue to remain. Uh, the model, but that model itself would undergo crucial historical displacements and uh, tensions. No, but uh, so again, that's the commercial part. But uh, let's come to the experimental impulse in Bengali cinema. Uh, this did not originate with Pothir Pachali, but certainly received great impetus by the film's domestic and international success. 
Ray's film created the existential grounds for, for brave new experiments with form and realism in an industry under Duras. This, these would include the crucial absorption of IPTA-inspired uh, impulses towards of people's theater and music, or the new vistas noted by the film society movement. The artistic tendency in Bengal was not exactly parallel to the commercial industry, but uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was close to it, it was contiguous to it. Uh, so it was not, one could argue that it was not limited to Ray, Ghatok, Barin Shah, or Rajan Tarukdar, or the early Mrinal Shin, but extended in some ways to figures like Tapan Sina, Torun Mojumdar, Ajay Kaur, or the combined Jatrik, who made uh, remarkable films within the commercial fold, uh, or at times departing from it. Now that this artistic revolution in Bengali cinema uh, now, what was this artistic revolution? Uh, you know, we're talking about a Bengali cinema that had been traditionally dialogue based following classic novels and stories. In both Chidananda Dashgupta and Sharod Shen, Shen Gupta's writings on filmfare, there was a general argument that this meant that this, these new films uh, again, primarily inspired by Pothir Pacheli, but uh, there was a new cinematic universe altogether in various forms, in various films, where the cinematic image was coming to its own. It's coming, it was becoming alive. Uh, the cinematic image had to be detached from the literary world. Uh, film uh, had to stop being caught a running commentary on literature. This revolution had begun in earnest with Pothir Pachali, but while Dashgupta, uh, at that point in the late 50s, confined it to more or less Ray and Ghatak. Uh, Shorod Gupta, on the other hand, as I've already mentioned, uh, sees the same impulse in many other films and filmmakers. The plain thinking and high the plain filming and high thinking style of Bengal. The literary reformist commercial idiom bolstered by an experimental blend was generally praised in the Indian uh, bourgeois context. By 1962, the industry had won five out of the first 10 president's gold medals at the state awards, what we call the national awards today. Apart from Ray's plethora of international awards and citations. Topon Shina's <coughs> Kabuliala, uh, 1957, had received a special jury prize at the 7th Berlin Film Festival. Sinha's other films like Kudito Pasha, 1960, Hashuli Bakke Rupokatha, 1962, Ni uh, Nijon Shoikate, 1963, garnered attention at Dublin, San Francisco, and Sydney. Uh, his Otiti, 1966, earned a certificate of merit at Venice. And his Arohi, 1965, the Silver Leopard at Locarno, along with a diplom diploma in London. Ghatok's Ojantrik, 1958, and Ogrogami's Headmaster, 1958, were screened at Venice. Ojoy Kors Shatpake Badha, 1963, featured in the Moscow Film Festival. So one can understand why Sharad Chengupta was excited about an imminent uh, Bengali new wave. Filmfare reported considerable interest uh, in Bombay about these overseas um, market prospects. Uh, the June 2nd, 1961 issue uh, carried a statement by the noted distributor and producer Tarachat Barjatia the same house which would later make films like uh, Hum Aap Ke Hai Kaun. So that Burjatia. Uh, so he talked about his plans to make invest in Bengali cinema. Burjatia said, quote, I want to produce these films for the international market. 
I propose to dub the best of them in English and French. And if the film is really good, I, I may remake it entirely in English and French. Such films can only be made in Kolkata, which is the center of art, culture, and creative work. Unquote. Now, Bajatia's enthusiasm was not unusual at that time. Raj Kapoor had just produced a Bengali film, Agdin Rathre slash Jakte Rahul, that had won the Grand, Grand Prix at uh, Carlo Vivari. The southern studio AVM was in talks with uh, superstar Uttam Kumar for a Bengali remake of his box office hit, Ogni Porikha. But AVM had already invested in a uh, uh, Bengali film, Prabhat Mukherjee's Akash Patal, 1960. And V. Shantaram was about to produce uh, Tolun Mojumdar's Polatak, which came out in 1963. Yet, Bachatia of Rajashri Pictures did not eventually follow up on his declaration. Just as AVM's ambitious Hindi Agni Pariksha never happened. These extinguished possibilities were only two of many similar ones featured in the filmfare pages between 1955 and 1965 and beyond. If we look at the actual history, we see a few things. Production values, now if we talk about what actually happened, Production values of Bengali films would remain modest and actually decrease in relative terms. Location shoots, outdoor location shoots, uh, apart from you know rare occasions like Bhogini Nibedita, where there was an outdoor in London, or uh, Topan Sinha's Kabuliala, which had a very short uh, excursion uh, to Afghanistan. <coughs> location shoots in Bengali films would largely be restricted to East, uh, East India. Color, beginning with a few scenes in uh, uh, the 1955 film, Doshu Mohon, color would not become standard in Bengali cinema till the 1980s. The avoidance of spectacle and sensation, a general focus on good story, uh, was not, were not just outcomes of enlightened uh, cultural uh, voluntarism of uh, the Bengali. Uh, one could also argue that, uh, you know, uh, there was no money to make, uh, you know, spectacular and sensational films. <coughs> and uh, so they were consequences of a lack of growth and extension of markets and an overall failure to attract capital and collaboration from more prosperous industries. Now, we know that story, but let us look at certain things why, that were happening during the late 50s and early 60s that were, uh, you know, that were these were projects which ultimately did not happen, but they were planned. And because they were planned and announced and discussed, uh, one can understand that the industry was still thinking that, you know, especially after Ray's moment, that it could go, it could break really uh, new frontiers. So let's take a look at some of them. Uh, in 1956, Tolligan's SB Productions and uh, the Shui Miut Mo Film Company of Rangoon had announced a double version called Chobi based on Shark Chandra's film set in Burma. The film was never complete. In 1958, AD Films unveiled plans for the ambitious Onno novel. It's a film uh, to be shot in London with Uttam Kumar and two English female actors headlining the cast. Film never got made. Uh, it was abandoned a year later. Uh, and then also there was another project called Indra Dhanu. It was supposed to be, once again, starring Uttam Kumar. It was supposed to be shot in a luxury liner sailing from Bombay to Singapore. In 1959, Bishu Shen, a producer with apparent Hollywood and UK credentials, had arrived in Calcutta 
to location hunt for two English cinema cinema pictures, The Singing Mountain and Lawrence Hope. So this was uh, uh, the Calcutta Film Industry's potential Hollywood collaboration, which again did not happen. It would seem from the film fair pages that producer director Oshit Chaudhary uh, led Tollywood in terms of extending production values and finding new markets and also to dreaming of projects. Uh, in 1962, Chaudhary returned from a tour of the major world film industries and proposed development of the Bengali industry on the lines of Japan with no star system, modest budgets and cerebral films made for the export market. The same year, he announced plans for a color film starting with Tom Kumar, set in Europe and the United States. The following year, in 1963, uh, Filmfare reported another eventually aborted project called Rajpoth Janapoth. It was to be produced by Chaudhuri and directed by Tapan Shinha. It was to feature a black actor in the lead and it would be shot in Europe, United States and Africa. Never happened. Uh, so these were the international projects, but let's come to collaborations, potential collaborations with Bombay. Uh, the exchanges, exchanges with Bombay would follow a similar pattern of diminishing returns. In, in 1955, the Calcutta correspondent of Filmfare had announced a veritable flood <coughs> of Bombay in Bengal films instigated primarily by the film star studios. The stars from the West, uh, like Ashok Kumar, would act with Calcutta actors in productions taking place entirely in Calcutta. The flood did not materialize. On the other hand, exceptions aside, Calcutta-based producers discovered great difficulties in attempting Hindi remakes with viable distribution pro uh, prospects. They were not being able to do what uh, the Jamin, Geminis or the AVM studios of the South were doing, regularly doing, uh, dubbing their films or remaking them uh, into Hindi. Now, Washit Chaudhary, the producer, adapt, uh, adapted the hin hit Hindi film Uttar Falguni. Many of us have seen that as the reasonably successful Mamota in 1966 with major Hindi stars, Ashok Kumar and Dharmendra. But that was one. But his Saat Kadam, uh, an ambitious 1965 remake of Shoptopodi, uh, ran aground, as did Proluti Bhattacharya's historical Noti Binodini. Now, both these films, Saat Kadam and Noti Binodini, were supposed to feature the big Bombay star Rajendra Kumar. In 1967, producer Oshim Dokto announced a Rishikesh Mukherjee directed mega Bengali ve uh, venture called Ananda Shangbad, starring Raj Kapoor and Uttam Kumar. That too never saw the light of the day. I have a suspicion, a very strong one, that this film was later. Uh, made as Anand starring Rajesh Khanna and uh, Amitabh Bachchan. The Bengali good story imprint on mass market film, uh, Hindi film, unlike an earlier age when these films were actually made in Calcutta, would no longer be stamped in products made in the Tolygon suburbs of Calcutta. The task of making these Bengali flavored Hindi films would be outsourced to emigres and cultural alumni like Bimal Roy, Shottan Bosch, Phoni Mujimdar, Guru Dutt, Rishi, Rishikesh Mukherjee, etc. Uh, Shukti Shamantu being another very uh, key name. Exceptional cases like Tapon Sinha's Sagina 1974 uh, that were genuine Bombay Calcutta industrial collaborations would not open floodgates. Efforts to re release dubbed films for all India markets, like they did for Tamil and Telugu films, proved to be 
unsuccessful. Now, so this is the backdrop. Now let's return to Ray and try to locate Ray uh, in, that, in that map. <laughs> At least in terms of how the story unfolded in Filmfare. Ray's famous diffidence towards the Hindi language film is well known. In Filmfare itself, he made a telling statement in 1957 that he viewed the act of crossing over to Bombay and Hindi cinema not just a matter of migrating across linguistic cultures, but national horizons. Quote, we will make pictures in Bengali because we feel art must be root rooted in life. We must make films within our own national culture, the language and religion we know, the nuances we feel. Films fail primarily due to the absence of this link. A truly national film never lacks universal appeal. We believe that in Pothar Pachali and Apurajito, we have been able to communicate some essentially Bengali experiences in universally comprehensible terms." Unquote. <coughs> but it's quite natural to assume that there were period, periodic overtures made to Ray from Bombay quarters. In 1972, for instance, in the wake of his film, Kal Aaj or Kal, the actor-director Randhir Kapoor, revealed that Raj Kapoor, his father had asked the producer of, uh, his father and the producer of Kalaj or Kal, had initially offered the project to, to Ray. Ray uh, said that he would make the film only if it was in Bengali. However, much prior to that, in the course of the 60s, Filmfare periodically mentioned instances in which it was Ray who was repeated, who repeatedly expressed interest in making forays into the Hindi language market, only to be frustrated for one reason or the other. In 1959, it was uh, it was announced that Ray was making the Mahabharata in Technicolor, which was to be his first Hindi language film. Uh, the proposal, as Ray describes. Uh, somewhere, came from the industry in Madras with a budget that was about 20 times he had ever used in a film. But he had to withdraw following uh, disputes about artistic independence. Following that, Ray in 1962 had reportedly completed making arrangements for a Hindi version of his film Obhijan his first film, film featuring lead uh, protagonists with non-Bengali backgrounds and starring Wahida Rahman, a top Bombay star. The project did not materialize. In 1967, Ray apparently dropped his initial plan to make his anti-war fantasy, Gupi Gain Bhagavan, as a bilingual in color with the major Bombay star, Shashi Kapoor, in the lead for the Hindi version. <clears throat> so the years between 1955 and 1965 uh, were the beginning phase of a slightly more protracted period of existential adjustment. Adjustment to both commercial realities as well as viable aesthetic horizons. It was an era of testing the limits of industrial toleration for the experimental impulse. Broadly speaking, there were two avenues of triumphant progress. The artistic revolution, uh, artistic revolution instigated by Ray and some of his contemporaries that earned national prestige and unprecedented international attention. And then the commercial, commercially viable uh, Uttam Shuchitra model, uh, which was driven by star charisma, technical sophistication, and a new kind of music. The failures, on the other hand, were on two significant fronts. 
Apart from spor uh, sporadic efforts, there would be no continuation of the tradition of the Hindi films or bilinguals made in Bengal. The partition hit Calcutta industry, despite its aura of prestige, sobriety, and overseas success, would not attract persistent capital investment and collaboration from financially stronger centers in Bombay and Madras. What was more crucial was that Bengali cinema, in the fullness of time, would fail to secure, command, and extend its own exhibition distribution circuits, unlike this, the films of the South, the Telugu and Tamil industries especially. Calcutta would be unable to consolidate early bridges of production and regular exchange with nascent cinemas in uh, Oriya or uh, the Assamese industries. After 1971, apart from exceptions like Titash, uh, Kotok's Titash Ekti Nodin, Nodin Nam, uh, complicated historical realities would prevent the Calcutta industry from setting up channels of regular communication with the newly independent country of Bangladesh. So from that particular generation of the artistic revolution, only Minal Sen and then much later from the, roughly from the 1980s, Rittig Khatuk uh, would get international uh, recognition in Khatuk's case, posthumous uh, international recognition. Shotojit Ray's glittering international career, meanwhile, would continue uh, largely in a solitary fa fashion on its own without uh, creating the uh, Bengali new wave that was expected out of it uh, by the filmfare intellectuals of the late 50s and 60s. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Professor Basu. Thank you, Professor Basu for enlightening us on how cinema as a mass media evolved in India after Marx's struggle and how Ray tackled the issue of making films with national roots yet international outreach. You have taken us through the alleys of the history of Indian and Bengali cinema, Ray's rise and the launch of Bengali new wave, ushering a great era of Bengali cinema, carrying its own niche for itself worldwide. It is really a privilege for all of us to have you as a speaker in this webinar. You have managed to find out time from your busy academic engagement, even in these pandemic times. We have got up in the morning today and taken all the pain to attend this webinar. I was just watching while you were delivering your lecture, how the first ray of Shan embracing you. Thank you, Professor Bashu, for being with us and share your truly engaging and interesting finding. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, Formally, we have come, come to the end of this day's program and I would request my colleague and the joint convener of this webinar, Professor Shankar Ghosh, to uh, give the formal vote of thanks for the day. Yes, uh, right. yes, 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 I can hear. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, with this, we have come to an end of the first day of the seminar on uh, Shotsujit Ray and his works. I 
thank the speakers for being their usual incisive selves. And we are fascinated and moved by the eclectic mix of lectures, which have generated new entry points into the works of Ray. Our first speaker, uh, Sri Bishwajit Ray, walked us through Ray's exposition of the abuses of scientific inquiry. And uh, along the lines of uh, Bishwajit Ray's discussion, uh, we, we can think of Hirok Rajat Deshe, uh, where we encounter an absolutist regime employing tools of science and technology as, as a state machinery. And if we think of the reality that we inhabit, I think it is not really a very distant dream for us. And the second speaker, Sri Shomik Banerjee, uh, talked about the class specificity of a film like uh, Gopi Gain Bhagavain, which is generally perceived as uh, either a fable or, or a fantasy. And what, uh, and what he talked about is, is the assemblage of characters, the class spe specificity of the characters who happen to be, uh, say, in a way, remnants of uh, eight of the eight, uh, 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 typical feudal society, a feudal Bengali society of the late 18th century and uh, 19th century, early 19th century. And uh, uh, Sri Gautam Ghosh's state was an interesting contribution to our webinar as it, it's, it's, a, it's added a distinct flavor because uh, what we found out uh, is, is how a filmmaker makes sense of the creative process that uh, that goes into the making of, of another filmmaker. So that was a fascinating um, session indeed. And uh, finally, Onushtu Basu has touched upon a broad range of topics, a broad range of issues, uh, beginning from the reception of Ray's works in a pan-Indian context, especially uh, by the mass market located in Bombay by the stakeholders of the popular film industry in Bombay. And we also spoke about how Pothir Pachali inaugurated a new cinematic medium, although it did not uh, or, or it could not uh, flourish into a, 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 a new wave of cinema, proper, but uh, nonetheless it uh, fashioned a new cinematic medium. So, I thank the speakers again for the clarity of their expositions, for being the most sensitive and perceptive interlocutors of race works. And I also thank uh, uh, Secretary Maharaj, Shami Sharva Lokananda Ji Maharaj, and uh, the Principal Maharaj, as they shared the same enthusiasm in organizing this uh, webinar. I thank my colleagues, and Sri Arjay Ghosh, the head of the department in particular. I thank uh, the listeners who had joined us today, and I request everyone to join us tomorrow as we have four uh, fascinating se sessions lined up for tomorrow as well. So I believe I should sign off with this uh, today. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.